It was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking thirteen. Winston Smith, his chin nuzzled into his breast in an effort to escape the vile wind, slipped quickly through the glass doors of Victory Mansions, though not quickly enough to prevent a swirl of gritty dust from entering along with him. The hallway smelt of boiled cabbage and old rag mats. At one end of it, a coloured poster, too large for indoor display, had been tacked to the wall. It depicted simply an enormous face, more than a metre wide. The face of a man of about 45, with a heavy black moustache and ruggedly handsome features. Winston made for the stairs. It was no use trying the lift. Even at the best of times, it was seldom working, and at present, the electric current was cut off during daylight hours. It was part of the economy drive, in preparation for hate week. The flat was seven flights up, and Winston, who was 35 and had a varicose ulcer above his right ankle, went slowly, resting several times on the way. On each landing, opposite the lift shaft, the poster with the enormous face gazed from the wall. It was one of those pictures which are so contrived that the eyes follow you about when you move. Big Brother is watching you, the caption beneath it ran. Inside the flat, a fruity voice was reading out a list of figures which had something to do with the production of pig iron. The voice came from an oblong metal plaque, like a dulled mirror, which formed part of the surface of the right-hand wall. Winston turned a switch, and the voice sank somewhat, though the words were still distinguishable. The instrument, the telescreen it was called, could be dimmed, but there was no way of shutting it off completely. He moved over to the window, a smallish, frail figure, the meagerness of his body merely emphasised by the blue overalls, which were the uniform of the party. His hair was very fair, his face naturally sanguine, his skin roughened by coarse soap and blunt razor blades, and the cold of the winter that had just ended. Even through the shut window pane, the world looked cold. Down in the street, little eddies of wind were whirling dust and torn paper into spirals, and though the sun was shining and the sky a harsh blue, there seemed to be no colour in anything, except the posters that were plastered everywhere. The black mustachioed face gazed down from every commanding corner. There was one on the house front immediately opposite. Big Brother is watching you, the caption said, while the dark eyes looked deep into Winston's own. Down at street level, another poster, torn at one corner, flapped fitfully in the wind, alternately covering and uncovering the single word, Ingsoc. In the far distance, a helicopter skimmed down between the roofs, hovered for an instant like a blue bottle, and darted away again with a curving flight. It was the police patrol snooping into people's windows. The patrols did not matter, however. Only the thought police mattered. Behind Winston's back, the voice from the telescreen was still babbling away about pig iron and the over-fulfillment of the ninth three-year plan. The telescreen received and transmitted simultaneously. Any sound that Winston made, above the level of a very low whisper, would be picked up by it. Moreover, so long as he remained within the field of vision which the metal plaque commanded, he could be seen as well as heard. There was, of course, no way of knowing whether you were being watched at any given moment. How often, or on what system, the thought police plugged in on any individual wire was guesswork. It was even conceivable that they watched everybody all the time. But at any rate, they could plug in your wire whenever they wanted to. You had to live, did live, from habit that became instinct, 
in the assumption that every sound you made was overheard, and except in darkness, every movement scrutinised. Winston kept his back turned to the telescreen. It was safer, though, as he well knew, even a back can be revealing. A kilometre away, the Ministry of Truth, his place of work, towered vast and white above the grimy landscape. This, he thought, with a sort of vague distaste. This was London, chief city of Airstrip One, itself the third most populous of the provinces of Oceania. He tried to squeeze out some childhood memory that should tell him whether London had always been quite like this. Were there always these vistas of rotting 19th century houses, their sides shored up with forks of timber, their windows patched with cardboard and their roofs with corrugated iron, their crazy garden walls sagging in all directions, and the bombed sites where the plaster dust swirled in the air and the willow herbs straggled over the heaps of rubble and the places where the bombs had cleared a larger patch, and there had sprung up sordid colonies of wooden dwellings like chicken houses. But it was no use. He could not remember. Nothing remained of his childhood except a series of bright-lit tableau, occurring against no background and mostly unintelligible. The Ministry of Truth, mini-true in Newspeak, Newspeak was the official language of Oceania, was startlingly different from any other object in sight. It was an enormous pyramidal structure of glittering white concrete, soaring up terrace after terrace, 300 metres into the air. From where Winston stood, it was just possible to read, picked out on its white face in elegant lettering, the three slogans of the party. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. The Ministry of Truth contained, it was said, 3,000 rooms above ground level and corresponding ramifications below. Scattered about London, there were just three other buildings of similar appearance and size. So completely did they dwarf the surrounding architecture that from the roof of Victory Mansions you could see all four of them simultaneously. They were the homes of the four ministries between which the entire apparatus of government was divided. The Ministry of Truth, which concerned itself with news, entertainment, education and the fine arts. The Ministry of Peace, which concerned itself with war. The Ministry of Love, which maintained law and order, and the Ministry of Plenty, which was responsible for economic affairs. Their names in Newspeak, Mini True, Mini Pax, Mini Love, and Mini Plenty. The Ministry of Love was the really frightening one. There were no windows in it at all. Winston had never been inside the Ministry of Love, nor within half a kilometre of it. It was a place impossible to enter except on official business, and then only by penetrating through a maze of barbed wire entanglements, steel doors and hidden machine gun nests. Even the streets leading up to its outer barriers were roamed by gorilla-faced guards in black uniforms, armed with jointed truncheons. Winston turned round abruptly. He had set his features into the expression of quiet optimism which it was advisable to wear when facing the telescreen. He crossed the room into the tiny kitchen. By leaving the ministry at this time of day, he had sacrificed his lunch in the canteen, and he was aware that there was no food in the kitchen except a hunk of dark-coloured bread, which had got to be saved for tomorrow's breakfast. He took down from the shelf a bottle of colourless liquid with a plain white label marked Victory Gin. It gave off a sickly, oily smell, as of Chinese rice spirit. Winston poured out nearly a teacupful, nerved himself for a shock, and gulped it down like a dose of medicine. 
Instantly, his face turned scarlet, and the water ran out of his eyes. The stuff was like nitric acid, and moreover, in swallowing it, I had the sensation of being hit on the back of the head with a rubber club. The next moment, however, the burning in his belly died down, and the world began to look more cheerful. He took a cigarette from a crumpled packet marked Victory Cigarettes, and incautiously held it upright, whereupon the tobacco fell out onto the floor. But the next he was more successful. He went back to the living room and sat down at a small table that stood to the left of the telescreen. From the table drawer he took out a pen holder, a bottle of ink, and a thick, quarto-sized blank book with a red back and a marbled cover. For some reason, the telescreen in the living room was in an unusual position. Instead of being placed, as was normal, in the end wall, where it could command the whole room, it was in the longer wall, opposite the window. To one side of it, there was a shallow alcove in which Winston was now sitting, and which, when the flats were built, had probably been intended to hold bookshelves. By sitting in the alcove and keeping well back, Winston was able to remain outside the range of the telescreen, so far as sight went. He could be heard, of course, but so long as he stayed in his present position, he could not be seen. It was partly the unusual geography of the room that had suggested to him the thing he was now about to do. But it had also been suggested by the book that he had just taken out of the drawer. It was a peculiarly beautiful book. It's smooth, creamy paper, a little yellowed by age, it was of a kind that had not been manufactured for at least forty years past. He could guess, however, that the book was much older than that. He had seen it lying in the window of a frowsy little junk shop in a slummy quarter of the town just what quarter he did not now remember, and had been stricken immediately by an overwhelming desire to possess it. Party members were supposed not to go into ordinary shops. Dealing on the free market, it was called. But the rule was not strictly kept, because there were various things, such as shoelaces and razor blades, which it was impossible to get hold of in any other way. He had given a quick glance up and down the street and then had slipped inside and bought the book for two dollars fifty. At the time he was not conscious of wanting it for any particular purpose. He had carried it guiltily home in his briefcase. Even with nothing written in it, it was a compromising possession. The thing that he was about to do was to open a diary. This was not illegal. Nothing was illegal, since there were no longer any laws. But if detected, it was reasonably certain that it would be punished by death, or at least by twenty-five years in a forced labour camp. Winston fitted a nib into the pen holder and sucked it to get the grease off. The pen was an archaic instrument seldom used even for signatures, and he had procured one, furtively and with some difficulty, simply because of a feeling that the beautiful creamy paper deserved to be written on with a real nib, instead of being scratched with an ink pencil. Actually, he was not used to writing by hand. Apart from very short notes, it was usual to dictate everything into the speak-write, which was of course impossible for his present purpose. He dipped the pen into the ink, and then faltered for just a second. A tremor had gone through his bowels. To mark the paper was the decisive act. In small, clumsy letters, he wrote, April 4th, 1984. He sat back. A sense of 
complete helplessness had descended upon him. To begin with, he did not know with any certainty that this was 1984. It must be round about that date, since he was fairly sure that his age was 39, and he believed that he had been born in 1944 or 1945. But it was never possible nowadays to pin down any date within a year or two. For whom, it suddenly occurred to him to wonder, was he writing this diary? For the future? For the unborn? His mind hovered for a moment round the doubtful date on the page, and then fetched up with a bump against the new speak word. Double think. For the first time, the magnitude of what he had undertaken came home to him. How could you communicate with the future? It was, of its nature, impossible. Either the future would resemble the present, in which case it would not listen to him, or it would be different from it, and his predicament would be meaningless. For some time he sat gazing stupidly at the paper. The telescreen had changed over to strident military music. It was curious that he seemed not merely to have lost the power of expressing himself, but even to have forgotten what it was that he had originally intended to say. For weeks past, he had been making ready for this moment, and it had never crossed his mind that anything would be needed except courage. The actual writing would be easy. All he had to do was to transfer to paper the interminable, restless monologue that had been running inside his head literally for years. At this moment, however, even the monologue had dried up. Moreover, his varicose ulcer had begun itching unbearably. He dared not scratch it, because if he did so, it always became inflamed. The seconds were ticking by. He was conscious of nothing except the blankness of the page in front of him, the itching of the skin above his ankle, the blaring of the music, and a slight booziness caused by the gin. Suddenly he began writing in sheer panic, only imperfectly aware of what he was setting down. His small but childish handwriting straggled up and down the page, shedding first its capital letters, and finally even its full stops. April 4th, 1984 Last night to the flicks, all war films, one very good one of a ship full of refugees being bombed somewhere in the Mediterranean, audience much amused by shots of a great huge fat man trying to swim away with a helicopter after him. First you saw him wallowing along in the water like a porpoise, then you saw him through the helicopter's gun sights. Then he was full of holes, and the sea round him turned pink, and he sank as suddenly as though the holes had let in the water. Audience shouting with laughter when he sank. Then you saw a lifeboat full of children with a helicopter hovering over it. There was a middle-aged woman, might have been a Jewess, sitting up in the bow with a little boy about three years old in her arms. Little boy screaming with fright, and hiding his head between her breasts as if he was trying to burrow right into her, and the woman putting her arms round him and comforting him, although she was blue with fright herself, all the time covering him up as much as possible as if she thought her arms could keep the bullets off him. Then the helicopter planted a twenty-kilo bomb in among them. Terrific flash, and the boat went all to matchwood. Then there was a wonderful shot of a child's arm going up, 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 right up into the air. A helicopter with a camera in its nose must have followed it up, and there was a lot of applause from the party seats, but a woman down in the prole part of the house suddenly started kicking up a fuss and shouting they didn't ought to have showed it. Not in front of kids, they didn't. It ain't right. Not in front of kids, it ain't. Until the police turned her, turned her out. I don't suppose anything happened to her. Nobody cares what the proles say. Typical prole reaction. They never... Winston stopped writing. Partly because he was suffering from cramp. He did not know what had made him pour out this stream of rubbish. But the curious thing was that while he was doing so, a totally different memory had clarified itself in his mind, 
to the point where he almost felt equal to writing it down. It was, he now realised, because of this other incident that he had suddenly decided to come home and begin the diary today. It had happened that morning at the ministry, if anything so nebulous could be said to happen. It was nearly eleven hundred, and in the records department, where Winston worked, they were dragging the chairs out of the cubicles and grouping them in the centre of the hall opposite the big telescreen in preparation for the two minutes' hate. Winston was just taking his place in one of the middle rows when two people whom he knew by sight but had never spoken to came unexpectedly into the room. One of them was a girl whom he often passed in the corridors. He did not know her name, but he knew that she worked in the fiction department. Presumably, since he had sometimes seen her with oily hands and carrying a spanner, she had some mechanical job on one of the novel-writing machines. She was a bold-looking girl, of about twenty-seven, with thick hair, a freckled face, and swift athletic movements. A narrow scarlet sash, emblem of the Junior Anti-Sex League, was wound several times round the waist of her overalls, just tightly enough to bring out the shapeliness of her hips. Winston had disliked her from the very first moment of seeing her. He knew the reason. It was because of the atmosphere of hockey fields and cold baths and community hikes and general clean-mindedness which he managed to carry about with her. He disliked nearly all women, and especially the young and pretty ones. It was always the women, and above all the young ones, who were the most bigoted adherents of the party, the swallowers of slogans, the amateur spies and noses out of unorthodoxy. But this particular girl gave him the impression of being more dangerous than most. Once, when they passed in the corridors, she gave him a quick sidelong glance which seemed to pierce right into him, and for a moment had filled him with black terror. The idea had even crossed his mind that she might be an agent of the Thought Police. That, it was true, was very unlikely. Still, he continued to feel a peculiar uneasiness, which had fear mixed up in it as well as hostility, whenever she was anywhere near him. The other person was a man named O'Brien, a member of the inner party, and holder of some post so important and remote that Winston had only a dim idea of its nature. A momentary hush passed over the group of people round the chairs as they saw the black overalls of an inner party member approaching. O'Brien was a large burly man, with a thick neck and a coarse, humorous, brutal face. In spite of his formidable appearance, he had a certain charm of manner. He had a trick of resettling his spectacles on his nose which was curiously disarming. In some indefinable way, curiously civilised. It was a gesture which, if anyone had still thought in such terms, might have recalled an 18th century nobleman offering his snuff-box. Winston had seen O'Brien perhaps a dozen times in almost as many years. He felt deeply drawn to him, and not solely because he was intrigued by the contrast between O'Brien's urbane manner and his prize-fighter's physique. Much more it was because of a secretly held belief, or perhaps not even a belief, merely a hope, that O'Brien's political orthodoxy was not perfect. Something in his face suggested it irresistibly. And again, perhaps it was not even unorthodoxy that was written in his face, but simply intelligence. But at any rate, he had the appearance of being a person that you could talk to if somehow you could cheat the telescreen and get him alone. Winston had never made the smallest effort to verify this guess. Indeed, there was no way of doing so. At this moment, O'Brien glanced at his wristwatch, saw that it was nearly eleven hundred, 
and evidently decided to stay in the records department until the two minutes' hate was over. He took a chair in the same row as Winston, a couple of places away. A small, sandy-haired woman who worked in the next cubicle to Winston was between them. The girl with the dark hair was sitting immediately behind. The next moment, a hideous, grinding speech, as of some monstrous machine running without oil, burst from the big telescreen at the end of the room. It was a noise that set one's teeth on edge and bristled the hair at the back of one's neck. The hate had started. As usual, the face of Emmanuel Goldstein, the enemy of the people, had flashed onto the screen. There were hisses here and there among the audience. The little sandy-haired woman gave a squeak of mingled fear and disgust. Goldstein was the renegade and backslider, who once, long ago, how long ago, nobody quite remembered, had been one of the leading figures of the party, almost on a level with Big Brother himself, and then had engaged in counter-revolutionary activities, had been condemned to death, and had mysteriously escaped and disappeared. The programs of the two-minute hate varied from day to day, but there was none in which Goldstein was not the principal figure. He was the primal traitor, the earliest defiler of the party's purity. All subsequent crimes against the party, all treacheries, acts of sabotage, heresies, deviations, sprang directly out of his teaching. Somewhere or other he was still alive and hatching his conspiracies. Perhaps somewhere beyond the sea, under the protection of his foreign paymasters, perhaps even, so it was occasionally rumoured, in some hiding place in Oceania itself. Winston's diaphragm was constricted. He could never see the face of Goldstein without a painful mixture of emotions. It was a lean Jewish face, with a great fuzzy aureole of white hair and a small goatee beard. A clever face, and yet somehow inherently despicable, with a kind of senile silliness in the long, thin nose, near the end of which a pair of spectacles was perched. It resembled the face of a sheep, and the voice, too, had a sheep-like quality. Goldstein was delivering his usual venomous attack upon the doctrines of the party, an attack so exaggerated and perverse that a child should have been able to see through it. And yet, just plausible enough to fill one with an alarmed feeling that other people, less level-headed than oneself, might be taken in by it. He was abusing Big Brother. He was denouncing the dictatorship of the party. He was demanding the immediate conclusion of peace with Eurasia. He was advocating freedom of speech, freedom of the press, Freedom of assembly. Freedom of thought. He was crying hysterically that the revolution had been betrayed. And all this in rapid, polysyllabic speech, which was a sort of parody of the habitual style of the orators of the party, and even contained newspeak words. More newspeak words indeed than any party member would normally use in real life. And all the while lest one should be in any doubt as to the reality which Goldstein's specious claptrap covered, behind his head on the telescreen there marched the endless columns of the Eurasian army, row after row of solid-looking men with expressionless Asiatic faces, whom swam up to the surface of the screen and vanished, to be replaced by others exactly similar. The dull, rhythmic tramp of the soldiers' boots formed the background to Goldstein's bleating voice. Before the hate had proceeded for thirty seconds, uncontrollable exclamations of rage were breaking out from half the people in the room. The self-satisfied, sheep-like face on the screen and the terrifying power of the Eurasian army behind it were too much to be borne. Besides, 
The sight or even the thought of Goldstein produced fear and anger automatically. He was an object of hatred more constant than either Eurasia or East Asia, since when Oceania was at war with one of these powers, it was generally at peace with the other. But what was strange was that although Goldstein was hated and despised by everybody, although every day and a thousand times a day, on platforms, on the telescreen, in newspapers, in books, his theories were refuted, smashed, ridiculed, held up to the general gaze for the pitiful rubbish that they were, in spite all of this, his influence never seemed to grow less. Always there were fresh dupes waiting to be seduced by him. A day never passed when spies and saboteurs acting under his directions were not unmasked by the thought police. He was the commander of a vast, shadowy army, an underground network of conspirators dedicated to the overthrow of the state. The Brotherhood, its name was supposed to be. There were also whispered stories of a terrible book, a compendium of all the heresies of which Goldstein was the author and which circulated clandestinely here and there. It was a book without a title. People referred to it, if at all, simply as The Book. But one knew of such things only through vague rumours. Neither The Brotherhood nor The Book was a subject that any ordinary party member would mention if there was a way of avoiding it. In its second minute, the hate rose to a frenzy. People were leaping up and down in their places and shouting at the tops of their voices in an effort to drown the maddening, bleating voice that came from the screen. The little sandy-haired woman had turned bright pink, and her mouth was opening and shutting like that of a landed fish. Even O'Brien's heavy face was flushed. He was sitting very straight in his chair, his powerful chest swelling and quivering as though he was standing up to the assault of a wave. The dark-haired girl behind Winston had begun crying out, Swine! 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 And suddenly she picked up a heavy newspeak dictionary and flung it at the screen. It struck Goldstein's nose and bounced off. The voice continued inexorably. In a lucid moment, Winston found that he was shouting with the others and kicking his heel violently against the rung of his chair. The horrible thing about the two minutes' hate was not that one was obliged to act a part, but on the contrary, it was impossible to avoid joining in. Within thirty seconds, any pretense was always unnecessary. A hideous ecstasy of fear and vindictiveness, a desire to kill, to torture, to smash faces in with a sledgehammer, seemed to flow through the whole group of people like an electric current, turning one even against one's will into a grimacing, screaming lunatic. And yet, the rage that one felt was an abstract, undirected emotion, which could be switched from one object to another like the flame of a blow lamp. Thus, at one moment, Winston's hatred was not turned against Goldstein at all, but on the contrary, against Big Brother, the party, and the Thought Police, and at such moments his heart went out to the lonely, derided heretic on the screen, sole guardian of truth and sanity in a world of lies. And yet, the very next instant, he was at one with the people about him, and all that was said of Goldstein seemed to him to be true. At those moments, his secret loathing of Big Brother changed into adoration, and Big Brother seemed to tower up an invincible, fearless protector, standing like a rock against the hordes of Asia. And Goldstein, in spite of his isolation, his helplessness, and the doubt that hung about his very existence, seemed like some sinister enchanter, capable by the mere power of his voice of wrecking the structure of civilization. It was even possible at moments to switch one's hatred this way or that by a voluntary act. Suddenly, by the sort of violent effort which one wrenches one's head away from the pillow in a nightmare, 
Winston succeeded in transferring his hatred from the face on the screen to the dark-haired girl behind him. Vivid, beautiful hallucinations flashed through his mind. He would flog her to death with a rubber truncheon. He would tie her naked to a stake and shoot her full of arrows like Saint Sebastian. He would ravish her and cut her throat at the moment of climax. Better than ever before, moreover, he realised why it was that he hated her. He hated her because she was young and pretty and sexless, because he wanted to go to bed with her and would never do so, because round her sweet, supple waist, which seemed to ask you to encircle it with your arm, there was only the odious scarlet sash, aggressive symbol of chastity. The hate rose to its climax. The voice of Goldstein had become an actual sheep's bleat, and for an instant the face changed into that of a sheep. Then the sheep face melted into the figure of a Eurasian soldier who seemed to be advancing, huge and terrible, his submachine gun roaring and seeming to spring out of the surface of the screen so that some of the people in the front row actually flinched backwards in their seats. But in the same moment, drawing a deep sigh of relief from everybody, the hostile figure melted into the face of Big Brother. Black-haired, black-mustachioed, full of power and mysterious calm, and so vast that it almost filled up the screen. Nobody heard what Big Brother was saying. It was merely a few words of encouragement, the sort of words that are uttered in the din of battle, not distinguishable individually, but restoring confidence by the fact of being spoken. Then the face of Big Brother faded away again, and instead the three slogans of the party stood out in bold capitals. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. But the face of Big Brother seemed to persist for several seconds on the screen, as though the impact that it had made on everyone's eyeballs was too vivid to wear off immediately. The little sandy-haired woman had flung herself forward over the back of the chair in front of her, with a tremulous murmur that sounded like, My saviour! She extended her arms towards the screen. Then she buried her face in her hands. It was apparent that she was uttering a prayer. At this moment, the entire group of people broke into a deep, slow, rhythmical chant of B. 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 For perhaps as much as thirty seconds they kept it up. It was a refrain that was often heard in moments of overwhelming emotion. Partly it was a sort of him, to the wisdom and majesty of Big Brother, but still more it was an act of self-hypnosis, a deliberate drowning of consciousness by means of rhythmic noise. Winston's entrails seemed to grow cold. In the two minutes' hate, he could not help sharing in the general delirium, but this subhuman chanting of be, 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 always filled him with horror. Of course, he chanted with the rest. It was impossible to do otherwise. To dissemble your feelings, to control your face, to do what everyone else was doing was an instinctive reaction, but there was a space of a couple of seconds during which the expression of his eyes might conceivably have betrayed him. And it was exactly at this moment that the significant thing happened. If indeed it did happen. Momentarily, he caught O'Brien's eye. O'Brien had stood up. He had taken off his spectacles and was in the act of resettling them on his nose with his characteristic gesture. But there was a fraction of a second when their eyes met. 
and for as long as it took it to happen, Winston knew. Yes, he knew that O'Brien was thinking the same thing as himself. An unmistakable message had passed. It was as though their two minds had opened, and the thoughts were flowing from one into the other through their eyes. I am with you, O'Brien seemed to be saying to him. I know all about your contempt, your hatred, your disgust. But don't worry. I am on your side. And then the flash of intelligence was gone, and O'Brien's face was as inscrutable as everybody else's. That was all. And he was already uncertain whether it had happened. Such incidents never had any sequel. All that they did was to keep alive in him the belief, or hope, that others beside himself were the enemies of the party. Perhaps the rumours of vast underground conspiracies were true after all. Perhaps the Brotherhood really existed. It was impossible, in spite of the endless arrests and confessions and executions, to be sure that the Brotherhood was not simply a myth. Some days he believed in it, some days not. There was no evidence, only fleeting glimpses that might mean anything or nothing. Snatches of overheard conversation, faint scribbles on lavatory walls. Once, even, when two strangers met, a small movement of the hand which had looked as though it might be a signal of recognition. It was all guesswork. Very likely he had imagined everything. He had gone back to his cubicle without looking at O'Brien again. The idea of following up their momentary contact hardly crossed his mind. It would have been inconceivably dangerous even if he had known how to set about doing it. For a second, two seconds, they had exchanged an equivocal glance. And that was the end of the story. But even that was a memorable event in the locked loneliness in which one had to live. Winston roused himself and sat up straighter. He let out a belch. The gin was rising from his stomach. His eyes refocused on the page. He discovered that while he sat helplessly musing, he had also been writing as though by automatic action. And it was no longer the same cramped, awkward handwriting as before. His pen had slid voluptuously over the smooth paper, printing in large, neat capitals, Down with Big Brother, Down with Big Brother, Down with Big Brother, Down with Big Brother, Down with Big Brother. Down with big over and over again, filling half a page. He could not help feeling a twinge of panic. It was absurd, since the writing of those particular words was not more dangerous than the initial act of opening the diary. But for a moment he was tempted to tear out the spoiled pages and abandon the enterprise altogether. He did not do so, however, because he knew that it was useless. Whether he wrote down with Big Brother, or whether he refrained from writing it, made no difference. Whether he went on with the diary, or whether he did not go on with it, made no difference. The thought police would get him just the same. He had committed, would still have committed, even if he had never set pen to paper, the essential crime that contained all others in itself. Thought crime, they called it. Thought crime was not a thing that could be concealed forever. You might dodge successfully for a while, even for years. But sooner or later, they were bound to get you. It was always at night. The arrests invariably happened at night. The sudden jerk out of sleep. The rough hand shaking your shoulder the lights glaring in your eyes, 
the ring of hard faces round the bed. In the vast majority of cases, there was no trial, no report of the arrest. People simply disappeared, always during the night. Your name was removed from the registers. Every record of everything you had ever done was wiped out. Your one-time existence was denied and then forgotten. You were abolished, annihilated. Vaporized was the usual word. For a moment he was seized by a kind of hysteria. He began writing in a hurried, untidy scrawl. They'll shoot me, I don't care. They'll shoot me in the back of the neck, I don't care. Down with Big Brother. They always shoot you in the back of the neck, I don't care. Down with Big Brother. He sat back in his chair, slightly ashamed of himself, and laid down the pen. The next moment he started violently. There was a knocking at the door. Already? He sat as still as a mouse, in the futile hope that whoever it was might go away after a single attempt. But no. The knocking was repeated. The worst thing of all would be to delay. His heart was thumping like a drum, but his face from long habit was probably expressionless. He got up and moved heavily towards the door. As he put his hand to the doorknob, Winston saw that he had left the diary open on the table. Down with Big Brother was written all over it, in letters almost big enough to be legible across the room. It was an inconceivably stupid thing to have done. But he realised, even in his panic, he had not wanted to smudge the creamy paper by shutting the book while the ink was wet. He drew in his breath and opened the door. Instantly, a warm wave of relief flowed through him. A colourless, crushed-looking woman with wispy hair and a lined face was standing outside. Oh, comrade, she began in a dreary, whining sort of voice. I thought I heard you come in. Do you think you could come across and have a look at our kitchen sink? It's got blocked up and... It was Mrs. Parsons, the wife of a neighbour on the same floor. Mrs. was a word somewhat discountenanced by the party. You were supposed to call everyone comrade, but with some women one used it instinctively. She was a woman of about thirty, but looking much older. One had the impression that there was dust in the creases of her face. Winston followed her down the passage. These amateur repair jobs were an almost daily irritation. Victory mansions were old flats, built in 1930 or thereabouts, and were falling to pieces. The plaster flaked constantly from ceilings and walls, the pipes burst in every hard frost, the roof leaked whenever there was snow. The heating system was usually running at half steam when it was not closed down altogether from motives of economy. Repairs, except what you could do for yourself, had to be sanctioned by remote committees which were liable to hold up even the mending of a window pane for two years. Of course, it's only because Tom isn't home, said Mrs. Parsons vaguely. The Parsons' flat was bigger than Winston's and dingy in a different way. Everything had a battered, trampled-on look, as though the place had just been visited by some large, violent animal. Games impedimenta, hockey sticks, boxing gloves, a burst football, a pair of sweaty shorts turned inside out, lay all over the floor, and on the table there was a litter of dirty dishes and dog-eared exercise books. 
On the walls were scarlet banners of the Youth League and the Spies, and a full-sized poster of Big Brother. There was the usual boiled cabbage smell, common to the whole building, but it was shot through by a sharper reek of sweat, which, one knew this at the first sniff, though it was hard to say how, was the sweat of some person not present at the moment. In another room, someone with a comb and a piece of toilet paper was trying to keep tune with the military music, which was still issuing from the telescreen. It's the children, said Mrs. Parsons, casting a half-apprehensive glance at the door. They haven't been out today, and of course... She had a habit of breaking off her sentences in the middle. The kitchen sink was full nearly to the brim with filthy greenish water which smelt worse than ever of cabbage. Winston knelt down and examined the angle joint of the pipe. He hated using his hands, and he hated bending down, which was always liable to start him coughing. Mrs. Parsons looked on helplessly. Of course, if Tom was home, he'd put it right in a moment, she said. He loves anything like that. He's ever so good with his hands, Tom is. Parsons was Winston's fellow employee at the Ministry of Truth. He was a fattish but active man of paralyzing stupidity, a mass of imbecile enthusiasms, one of those completely unquestioning, devoted drudges on whom, more even than on the thought police, the stability of the party depended. At thirty-five, he had just been unwillingly evicted from the Youth League, and before graduating into the Youth League, he had managed to stay on in the spies for a year beyond the statutory age. At the Ministry, he was employed in some subordinate post for which intelligence was not required. But on the other hand, he was a leading figure on the Sports Committee, and all the other committees engaged in organising community hikes, spontaneous demonstrations, savings campaigns, and voluntary activities generally. He would inform you, with quiet pride, between whiffs of his pipe, that he had put in an appearance at the community centre every evening for the past four years. An overpowering smell of sweat, a sort of unconscious testimony to the strenuousness of his life, followed him about wherever he went, and even remained behind him after he had gone. "'Have you got a spanner?' said Winston fiddling with the nut on the angle joint. A spanner, said Mrs. Parsons, immediately becoming invertebrate. I don't know, I'm sure. Perhaps the children... There was a trampling of boots and another blast on the comb as the children charged into the living room. Mrs. Parsons brought the spanner. Winston let out the water and disgustedly removed the clot of human hair that had blocked up the pipe. He cleaned his fingers as best he could in the cold water from the tap, and went back into the other room. "'Up with your hands!' yelled a savage voice. A handsome, tough-looking boy of nine had popped up from behind the table and was menacing him with a toy automatic pistol, while his small sister, about two years younger, made the same gesture with a fragment of wood. Both of them were dressed in the blue shorts, grey shirts and red neckerchiefs, which were the uniform of the spies. Winston raised his hands above his head, but with an uneasy feeling. So vicious was the boy's demeanour that it was not altogether a game. "'You're a traitor!' yelled the boy. "'You're a thought criminal! You're a Eurasian spy! I'll shoot you! I'll vaporise you! I'll send you to the salt mines!' Suddenly they were both leaping round him, shouting, traitor and thought criminal, the little girl imitating her brother in every movement. It was somehow slightly frightening, like the gambling of tiger cubs which will soon grow up into man-eaters. There was a sort of calculating ferocity in the boy's eye, a quite evident desire to hit or kick Winston, and a consciousness of being very nearly big enough to do so. It was a good job it was not a real pistol he was holding, Winston thought. Mrs. Parsons' eyes flitted nervously from Winston to the children and back again. 
In the better light of the living room, he noticed with interest that there actually was dust in the creases of her face. They do get so noisy, she said. They're disappointed because they couldn't go to see the hanging. That's what it is. I'm too busy to take them, and Tom won't be back from work in time. Why can't we go to the hanging? roared the boy in his huge voice. Want to see the hanging, want to see the hanging, chanted the little girl, still capering round. Some Eurasian prisoners, guilty of war crimes, were to be hanged in the park that evening, Winston remembered. This happened about once a month, and was a popular spectacle. Children always clamoured to be taken to see it. He took his leave of Mrs Parsons and made for the door, but he had not gone six steps down the passage when something hit the back of his neck, an agonisingly painful blow. It was as though a red-hot wire had been jabbed into him. He spun round just in time to see Mrs Parsons dragging her son back into the doorway, while the boy pocketed a catapult. Goldstein! bellowed the boy as the door closed on him. But what most struck Winston was the look of helpless fright on the woman's greyish face. Back in the flat, he stepped quickly past the telescreen and sat down at the table again, still rubbing his neck. The music from the telescreen had stopped. Instead, a clipped military voice was reading out, with a sort of brutal relish, a description of the armaments of the new floating fortress which had just been anchored between Iceland and the Faroe Islands. With those children, he thought, that wretched woman must lead a life of terror. Another year, two years, and they would be watching her night and day for symptoms of unorthodoxy. Nearly all children nowadays were horrible. What was worst of all was that, by means of such organisations as the spies, they were systematically turned into ungovernable little savages, and yet this produced in them no tendency whatever to rebel against the discipline of the party. On the contrary, they adored the party, and everything connected with it. The songs, the processions, the banners, the hiking, the drilling with dummy rifles, the yelling of slogans, the worship of Big Brother. It was all a sort of glorious game to them. All their ferocity was turned outwards, against the enemies of the state, against foreigners, traitors, saboteurs, thought criminals. It was almost normal for people over thirty to be frightened of their own children, and with good reason, for hardly a week passed in which the Times did not carry a paragraph describing how some eavesdropping little sneak, child hero was the phrase generally used, had overheard some compromising remark and denounced its parents to the thought police. The sting of the catapult bullet had worn off. He picked up his pen half-heartedly, wondering whether he could find something more to write in the diary. Suddenly he began thinking of O'Brien again. Years ago. How long was it? Seven years, it must be. He had dreamed that he was walking through a pitch-dark room, and someone sitting to one side of him had said as he passed, We shall meet in the place where there is no darkness. It was said very quietly, almost casually, a statement, not a command. He had walked on without pausing. What was curious was that at the time, in the dream, the words had not made much impression on him. It was only later, and by degrees, that they had seemed to take on significance. He could not now remember whether it was before or after having the dream that he had seen O'Brien for the first time, nor could he remember when he had first identified the voice as O'Brien's. But at any rate, the identification existed. It was O'Brien who had spoken to him out of the dark. Winston had never been able to feel sure, even after this morning's flash of the eyes it was still impossible to be sure, whether O'Brien was a friend or an enemy. Nor did it even seem to matter greatly. There was a link of understanding between them, more important than affection or partisanship. 
we shall meet in the place where there is no darkness, he had said. Winston did not know what it meant, only that in some way or another it would come true. The voice from the telescreen paused. A trumpet call, clear and beautiful, floated into the stagnant air. The voice continued raspingly. Attention! Your attention, please. A news flash has this moment arrived from the Malabar Front. Our forces in South India have won a glorious victory. I am authorised to say that the action we are now reporting may well bring the war within measurable distance of its end. Here is the news flash. Bad news coming, thought Winston. And sure enough, following on a gory description of the annihilation of a Eurasian army with stupendous figures of killed and prisoners, came the announcement that, as from next week, the chocolate ration would be reduced from 30 grams to 20. Winston belched again. The gin was wearing off, leaving a deflated feeling. The telescreen, perhaps to celebrate the victory, perhaps to drown the memory of the lost chocolate, crashed into Oceania tis for thee. You were supposed to stand to attention. However, in his present position, he was invisible. Oceania, tis for thee, gave way to lighter music. Winston walked over to the window, keeping his back to the telescreen. The day was still cold and clear. Somewhere far away, a rocket bomb exploded with a dull, reverberating roar. About twenty or thirty of them a week were falling on London at present. Down in the street, the wind flapped the torn poster to and fro, and the word Ingsoc fitfully appeared and vanished. The sacred principles of Ingsoc. Newspeak, doublethink, the mutability of the past. He felt as though he were wandering in the forests of the sea bottom, lost in a monstrous world where he himself was the monster. He was alone. The past was dead. The future was unimaginable. What certainty had he that a single human creature, now living, was on his side? And what way of knowing that the dominion of the party would not endure forever? Like an answer, the three slogans on the white face of the Ministry of Truth came back to him. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. He took a 25-cent piece out of his pocket. There, too, in tiny, clear lettering, the same slogans were inscribed, and on the other face of the coin, the head of Big Brother. Even from the coin, the eyes pursued you. On coins, on stamps, on the covers of books, on banners, on posters, and on the wrappings of a cigarette packet. Everywhere. Always the eyes watching you, and the voice enveloping you. Asleep or awake, working or eating, indoors or out of doors, in the bath or in bed. No escape. Nothing was your own except the few cubic centimetres inside your skull. The sun had shifted round, and the myriad windows of the Ministry of Truth, with the light no longer shining on them, looked grim as the loopholes of a fortress. His heart quailed before the enormous pyramidal shape. It was too strong. It could not be stormed. A thousand rocket bombs would not batter it down. He wondered again for whom he was writing the diary. For the future, for the past, for an age that might be imaginary. And in front of him there lay not death, but annihilation. The diary would be reduced to ashes and himself to vapour. Only the thought police would read what he had written before they wiped it out of existence and out of memory. How could you make an appeal to the future when not a trace of you, not even an anonymous word scribbled on a piece of paper, could physically survive? 
The telescreen struck fourteen. He must leave in ten minutes. He had to be back at work by fourteen thirty. Curiously, the chiming of the hour seemed to have put new heart into him. He was a lonely ghost uttering a truth that nobody would ever hear. But so long as he uttered it, in some obscure way, the continuity was not broken. It was not by making yourself heard, but by staying sane that you carried on the human heritage. He went back to the table, dipped his pen, and wrote, To the future, or to the past, to a time when thought is free, when men are different from one another and do not live alone, to a time when truth exists and what is done cannot be undone. From the age of uniformity, from the age of solitude, from the age of Big Brother, from the age of Doublethink. Greetings. He was already dead, he reflected. It seemed to him that it was only now, when he had begun to be able to formulate his thoughts, that he had taken the decisive step. The consequences of every act are included in the act itself. He wrote... Thought crime does not entail death. Thought crime is death. Now he had recognised himself as a dead man, it became important to stay alive as long as possible. Two fingers of his right hand were ink-stained, and it was exactly the kind of detail that might betray you. Some nosing zealot in the ministry, a woman probably, Someone like the little sandy-haired woman or the dark-haired girl from the fiction department might start wondering why he had been writing during the lunch interval, why he had used an old-fashioned pen, what he had been writing, and then drop a hint in the appropriate quarter. He went to the bathroom and carefully scrubbed the ink away with the gritty dark brown soap which rasped your skin like sandpaper and was therefore well adapted for this purpose. He put the diary away in the drawer. It was quite useless to think of hiding it, but he could at least make sure whether or not its existence had been discovered. A hair laid across the page ends was too obvious. With the tip of his finger he picked up an identifiable grain of whitish dust and deposited it on the corner of the cover, where it was bound to be shaken off if the book was moved. Winston was dreaming of his mother. He must, he thought, have been ten or eleven years old when his mother had disappeared. She was a tall, statuesque, rather silent woman, with slow movements and magnificent fair hair. His father he remembered more vaguely as dark and thin, dressed always in neat dark clothes. Winston remembered especially the very thin soles of his father's shoes, and wearing spectacles. The two of them must evidently have been swallowed up in one of the first great purges of the fifties. At this moment, his mother was sitting in some place deep down beneath him, with his young sister in her arms. He did not remember his sister at all, except as a tiny, feeble baby, always silent, with large, watchful eyes. Both of them were looking up at him. They were down in some subterranean place, the bottom of a well, for instance, or a very deep grave, but it was a place which, already far below him, was itself moving downwards. They were in the saloon of a sinking ship, looking up at him through the darkening water. There was still air in the saloon. They could still see him, and he them, but all the while they were sinking down, down, into the green waters, which in another moment must hide them from sight 
forever. He was out in the light and air, while they were being sucked down to death, and they were down there because he was up here. He knew it, and they knew it, and he could see the knowledge in their faces. There was no reproach either in their faces, or in their hearts, only the knowledge that they must die in order that he might remain alive, and that this was part of the unavoidable order of things. He could not remember what had happened, but he knew in his dream that in some way the lives of his mother and his sister had been sacrificed to his own. It was one of those dreams which, while retaining the characteristic dream scenery, are a continuation of one's intellectual life, and in which one becomes aware of facts and ideas which still seem new and valuable after one is awake. The thing that now suddenly struck Winston was that his mother's death, nearly thirty years ago, had been tragic and sorrowful in a way that was no longer possible. Tragedy, he perceived, belonged to the ancient time, to a time when there was still privacy, love and friendship, and when the members of a family stood by one another without needing to know the reason. His mother's memory tore at his heart because she had died loving him, when he was too young and selfish to love her in return, and because somehow, he did not remember how, she had sacrificed herself to a conception of loyalty that was private and unalterable. Such things, he saw, could not happen today. Today, there were fear, hatred, and pain, but no dignity of emotion, no deep or complex sorrows. All this he seemed to see in the large eyes of his mother and his sister, looking up at him through the green water, hundreds of fathoms down and still sinking. Suddenly he was standing on short springy turf, on a summer evening when the slanting rays of the sun gilded the ground. The landscape that he was looking at recurred so often in his dreams that he was never fully certain whether or not he had seen it in the real world. In his waking thoughts he called it the Golden Country. It was an old, rabbit-bitten pasture, with a foot track wandering across it and a molehill here and there. In the ragged hedge on the opposite side of the field, the boughs of the elm trees were swaying very faintly in the breeze, their leaves just stirring in dense masses like women's hair. Somewhere near at hand, though out of sight, there was a clear, slow-moving stream where dace were swimming in the pools under the willow trees. The girl with dark hair was coming towards them across the field. With what seemed a single movement, she tore off her clothes and flung them disdainfully aside. Her body was white and smooth, but it aroused no desire in him. Indeed, he barely looked at it. What overwhelmed him in that instant was admiration for the gesture with which she had thrown her clothes aside. With its grace and carelessness, it seemed to annihilate a whole culture, a whole system of thought, as though Big Brother and the party and the thought police could all be swept into nothingness by a single, splendid movement of the arm. That, too, was a gesture belonging to the ancient time. Winston woke up with the word Shakespeare on his lips. The telescreen was giving forth an ear-splitting whistle, which continued on the same note for thirty seconds. It was naught seven fifteen, getting up time for office workers. Winston wrenched his body out of bed, naked, for a member of the outer party received only three thousand clothing coupons annually, and a suit of pyjamas was six hundred, and seized a dingy singlet and a pair of shorts that were lying across a chair. The physical jerks would begin in three minutes. The next moment he was doubled up by a violent coughing fit, which nearly always attacked him soon after waking up. It emptied his lungs so completely that he could only begin breathing again by lying on his back and taking a series of deep gasps. His veins had swelled with the effort of the cough, and the varicose ulcer had started itching. 
30 to 40 group, yapped a piercing female voice. 30 to 40 group, take your places please. 30s to 40s. Winston sprang to attention in front of the telescreen, upon which the image of a youngish woman, scrawny but muscular, dressed in tunic and gym shoes, had already appeared. Arms bending and stretching, she rapped out. Take your time by me. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Come on, comrades, put a bit of life into it. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. The pain of the coughing fit had not quite driven out of Winston's mind the impression made by his dream, and the rhythmic movements of the exercise restored it somewhat as he mechanically shot his arms back and forth, wearing on his face the look of grim enjoyment which was considered proper during the physical jerks, he was struggling to think his way backward into the dim period of his early childhood. It was extraordinarily difficult. Beyond the late fifties, everything faded. When there were no external records that you could refer to, even the outline of your own life lost its sharpness. You remembered huge events, which had quite probably not happened. You remembered the detail of incidents without being able to recapture their atmosphere, and there were long blank periods to which you could assign nothing. Everything had been different then. Even the names of countries and their shapes on the map had been different. Airstrip 1, for instance, had not been so called in those days. It had been called England or Britain. Though London, he felt fairly certain, had always been called London. Winston could not definitely remember a time when his country had not been at war, but it was evident that there had been a fairly long interval of peace during his childhood, because one of his early memories was of an air raid, which appeared to take everyone by surprise. Perhaps it was the time when the atomic bomb had fallen on Colchester. He did not remember the raid itself, but he did remember his father's hand clutching his own as they hurried down, 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 into some place deep in the earth, round and round a spiral staircase which rang under his feet and which finally so wearied his legs that he began whimpering and they had to stop and rest. His mother, in her slow, dreamy way, was following a long way behind them. She was carrying his baby sister, or perhaps it was only a bundle of blankets that she was carrying. He was not certain whether his sister had been born then. Finally, they had merged into a noisy, crowded place, which he had realised to be a tube station. There were people sitting all over the stone-flagged floor, and other people, packed tightly together, were sitting on metal bunks, one above the other. Winston and his mother and father found themselves a place on the floor, and near them an old man and an old woman were sitting side by side on a bunk. The old man had on a decent dark suit and a black cloth cap pushed back from very white hair. His face was scarlet, and his eyes were blue and full of tears. He reeked of gin. It seemed to breathe out of his skin in place of sweat, and one could have fancied that the tears welling from his eyes were pure gin. But though slightly drunk, he was also suffering under some grief that was genuine and unbearable. In his childish way, Winston grasped that some terrible thing, something that was beyond forgiveness and could never be remedied, had just happened. It also seemed to him that he knew what it was. Someone whom the old man loved, a little granddaughter perhaps, had been killed. Every few minutes the old man kept repeating. We didn't ought to have trusted him. I said so, Ma, didn't I? That's what comes of trusting him. I said so all along. We didn't ought to have trusted the buggers. But which buggers they didn't ought to have trusted? Winston could not now remember. Since about that time... War had been literally continuous, though strictly speaking it had not always been the same war. For several months during his childhood there had been confusing street fighting in London itself, some of which he remembered vividly. But to trace out the history of the whole period, 
To say who was fighting whom at any given moment would have been utterly impossible, since no written record and no spoken word ever made mention of any other alignment than the existing one. At this moment, for example, in 1984, if it was 1984, Oceania was at war with Eurasia and in alliance with East Asia. In no public or private utterance was it ever admitted that the three powers had at any time been grouped along different lines. Actually, as Winston well knew, it was only four years since Oceania had been at war with East Asia and in alliance with Eurasia. But that was merely a piece of furtive knowledge which he happened to possess because his memory was not satisfactorily under control. Officially, the change of partners had never happened. Oceania was at war with Eurasia. Therefore, Oceania had always been at war with Eurasia. The enemy of the moment always represented absolute evil, and it followed that any past or future agreement with him was impossible. The frightening thing, he reflected, for the ten thousandth time as he forced his shoulders painfully backward, with hands on hips, they were gyrating their bodies from the waist, an exercise that was supposed to be good for the back muscles. The frightening thing was that it might all be true. If the party could thrust its hand into the past and say of this or that event, it never happened, that surely was more terrifying than mere torture and death. The party said Oceania had never been in alliance with Eurasia. He, Winston Smith, knew that Oceania had been in alliance with Eurasia as short a time as four years ago. But where did that knowledge exist? Only in his own consciousness, which in any case must soon be annihilated. And if all others accepted the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into history and became truth. Who controls the past, ran the party slogan, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. And yet the past, though of its nature alterable, had never been altered. Whatever was true now was true from everlasting to everlasting. It was quite simple. All that was needed was an unending series of victories over your own memory. Reality control, they called it. In new speak, double think. Stand easy, barked the instructress, a little more genially. Winston sank his arms to his sides and slowly refilled his lungs with air. His mind slid away into the labyrinthine world of doublethink. To know and not to know. To be conscious of complete truthfulness while telling carefully constructed lies. To hold simultaneously two opinions which cancelled out knowing them to be contradictory and believing in both of them. To use logic against logic. To repudiate morality while laying claim to it. To believe that democracy was impossible and that the party was the guardian of democracy. To forget whatever it was necessary to forget, then to draw it back into memory again at the moment when it was needed, and then promptly to forget it again. And above all, to apply the same process to the process itself. That was the ultimate subtlety. Consciously to induce unconsciousness, and then, once again, to become unconscious of the act of hypnosis you had just performed. Even to understand the word doublethink involved the use of doublethink. The instructress had called them to attention again. And now let's see which of us can touch our toes, she said enthusiastically. Right over from the hips, please, comrades. One, two, one, two. Winston loathed this exercise, which sent shooting pains all the way from his heels to his buttocks and often ended bringing on another coughing fit. The half-pleasant quality went out of his meditations. 
The past, he reflected, had not merely been altered. It had been actually destroyed. For how could you establish even the most obvious fact when there existed no record outside your own memory? He tried to remember in what year he had first heard mention of Big Brother. He thought it must have been at some time in the sixties, but it was impossible to be certain. In the party histories, of course, Big Brother figured as the leader and guardian of the revolution since its very earliest days. His exploits had been gradually pushed backwards in time, until already they extended into the fabulous world of the forties and the thirties, when the capitalists in their strange cylindrical hats still rode through the streets of London in great gleaming motor cars or horse carriages with glass sides. There was no knowing how much of this legend was true and how much invented. Winston could not even remember at what date the party itself had come into existence. He did not believe he had ever heard the word Ingsoc before 1960, but it was possible that in its old-speak form, English socialism, that is to say, it had been current earlier. Everything melted into mist. Sometimes, indeed, you could put your finger on a definite lie. It was not true, for example, as was claimed in the party history books, that the party had invented aeroplanes. He remembered aeroplanes since his earliest childhood. But you could prove nothing. There was never any evidence. Just once in his whole life, he had held in his hands unmistakable documentary proof of the falsification of an historical fact. And on that occasion... Smith! screamed the shrewish voice from the telescreen. 6079 Smith W. Yes, you. Bend lower, please. You can do better than that. You're not trying. Lower, please. That's better, comrade. Now stand at ease, the whole squad, and watch me. A sudden hot sweat had broken out all over Winston's body. His face remained completely inscrutable. Never show dismay. Never show resentment. A single flicker of the eyes could give you away. He stood watching while the instructress raised her arms above her head and... One could not say gracefully, but with remarkable neatness and efficiency bent over and tucked the first joint of her fingers under her toes. There, comrades, that's how I want to see you doing it. Watch me again. I'm 39 and I've had four children. Now, look. She bent over again. You see, my knees aren't bent. You can all do it if you want to, she added as she straightened herself up. Anyone under 45 is perfectly capable of touching his toes. We don't all have the privilege of fighting in the front line, but at least we can all keep fit. Remember our boys on the Malabar front and the sailors in the floating fortresses. Just think what they have to put up with. Now try again. That's better, comrade. That's much better she added encouragingly as Winston, with a violent lunge, succeeded in touching his toes with knees unbent for the first time in several years. With the deep, unconscious sigh which not even the nearness of the telescreen could prevent him from uttering when his day's work started, Winston pulled the speak right towards him, blew the dust from its mouthpiece, and put on his spectacles. Then he unrolled and clipped together four small cylinders of paper, which had already flopped out of the pneumatic tube on the right-hand side of his desk. In the walls of the cubicle, there were three orifices. To the right of the speakwrite, a small pneumatic tube for written messages, 
to the left, a larger one for newspapers, and in the side wall, within easy reach of Winston's arm, a large oblong slit protected by a wire grating. This last was for disposal of waste paper. Similar slits existed in thousands or tens of thousands throughout the building, not only in every room, but at short intervals in every corridor. For some reason they were nicknamed memory holes. When one knew that any document was due for destruction, or even when you saw a scrap of waste paper lying about, it was an automatic action to lift the flap of the nearest memory hole and drop it in, whereupon it would be whirled away on a current of warm air to the enormous furnaces which were hidden somewhere in the recesses of the building. Winston examined the four slips of paper which he had unrolled. Each contained a message of only one or two lines in the abbreviated jargon, not actually newspeak, but consisting largely of newspeak words, which was used in the Ministry for internal purposes. They ran Times 17384 BB Speech Mal Reported Africa Rectify Times 1912-83 Forecasts 3YP Fourth Quarter 83 Misprints Verify Current Issue Times 14-284 Mini Plenty Mal Quoted Chocolate Rectify Times 3.12.83 Reporting BB Day Order Double Plus Ungood Refs Unpersons Rewrite Fullwise Upsub Antifiling With a faint feeling of satisfaction, Winston laid the fourth message aside. It was an intricate and responsible job and had better be dealt with last. The other three were routine matters, though the second one would probably mean some tedious wading through lists of figures. Winston dialed back numbers on the telescreen and called for the appropriate issue of The Times, which slid out of the pneumatic tube after only a few minutes' delay. The messages he had received referred to articles or news items, which for one reason or another it was thought necessary to alter or, as the official phrase had it, to rectify. For example, it appeared from the Times of the 17th of March that Big Brother, in his speech of the previous day, had predicted that the South Indian Front would remain quiet, but the Eurasian Offensive would shortly be launched in North Africa. As it happened, the Eurasian Higher Command had launched its offensive in South India and left North Africa alone. It was therefore necessary to rewrite a paragraph of Big Brother's speech, in such a way to make him predict the thing that had actually happened. Or again, the Times of the 19th of December had published the official forecasts of the output of various classes of consumption goods in the fourth quarter of 1983, which was also the sixth quarter of the ninth three-year plan. Today's issue contained a statement of the actual output, from which it appeared that the forecasts were in every instance grossly wrong. Winston's job was to rectify the original figures by making them agree with the later ones. As for the third message, it referred to a very simple error which could be set right in a couple of minutes. As short a time ago as February, the Ministry of Plenty had issued a promise, a categorical pledge were the official words, that there would be no reduction of the chocolate ration during 1984. Actually, as Winston was aware, the chocolate ration was to be reduced from 30 grams to 20 at the end of the present week. All that was needed was to substitute from the original promise a warning that it would probably be necessary to reduce the ration at some time in April. As soon as Winston had dealt with each of the messages, he clipped his speak-written corrections to the appropriate copy of the Times and pushed them into the pneumatic tube. Then, with a movement which was as nearly as possible unconscious, he crumpled up the original message and any notes that he himself had made and dropped them into the memory hole to be devoured by the flames. What happened in the unseen labyrinth to which the pneumatic tubes led, he did not know in detail, but he did know in general terms. As soon as all the corrections which happened to be necessary in any particular number of the times had been assembled and collated, that number would be reprinted, the original copy destroyed, and the corrected copy placed on the files in its stead. 
This process of continuous alteration was applied not only to newspapers, but to books, periodicals, pamphlets, posters, leaflets, films, soundtracks, cartoons, photographs, to every kind of literature or documentation which might conceivably hold any political or ideological significance. Day by day, and almost minute by minute, the past was brought up to date. In this way, every prediction made by the party could be shown by documentary evidence to have been correct, nor was any item of news or any expression of opinion, which conflicted with the needs of the moment, ever allowed to remain on record. All history was a palimpsest, scraped clean and reinscribed exactly as often as was necessary. In no case would it have been possible, once the deed was done, to prove that any falsification had taken place. The largest section of the records department, far larger than the one on which Winston worked, consisted simply of persons whose duty it was to track down and collect all copies of books, newspapers, and other documents which had been superseded and were due for destruction. A number of the times which might, because of changes in political alignment or mistaken prophecies uttered by Big Brother, have been rewritten a dozen times, still stood on the files bearing its original date, and no other copy existed to contradict it. Books also were recalled and rewritten again and again, and were invariably reissued without any admission that any alteration had been made. Even the written instructions which Winston received, and which he invariably got rid of as soon as he had dealt with them, never stated or implied that any act of forgery was to be committed. Always the reference was to slips, errors, misprints, or misquotations which it was necessary to put right in the interests of accuracy. But actually, he thought, as he readjusted the Ministry of Plenty's figures, it was not even forgery. It was merely the substitution of one piece of nonsense for another. Most of the material that you were dealing with had no connection with anything in the real world, not even the kind of connection that it contained in a direct lie. Statistics were just as much a fantasy in their original version as in their rectified version. A great deal of the time you were expected to make them up out of your head. For example, the Ministry of Plenty's forecast had estimated the output of boots for the quarter at 145 million pairs. The actual output was given as 62 millions. Winston, however, in rewriting the forecast, marked the figure down to 57 millions, so as to allow for the usual claim that the quota had been over-fulfilled. In any case, 62 millions was no nearer the truth than 57 millions, more than 145 millions. Very likely, no boots had been produced at all. Likelier still, Nobody knew how many had been produced, much less cared. All one knew was that every quarter, astronomical numbers of boots were produced on paper, while perhaps half the population of Oceania went barefoot. And so it was with every class of recorded fact, great or small. Everything faded away into a shadow world in which, finally, even the date of the year had become uncertain. Winston glanced across the hall. In the corresponding cubicle on the other side, a small, precise-looking, dark-chinned man named Tillotson was working steadily away, with a folded newspaper on his knee and his mouth very close to the mouthpiece of the speakwright. He had the air of trying to keep what he was saying a secret between himself and the telescreen. He looked up, and his spectacles darted a hostile flash in Winston's direction. Winston hardly knew Tillotson, and had no idea what he was employed on. People in the records department did not readily talk about their jobs. In the long, windowless hall, with its double row of cubicles and its endless rustle of paper and hum of voices murmuring into speak rights, there were quite a dozen people whom Winston did not even know by name though he daily saw them hurrying to and fro in the corridors, or gesticulating in the two minutes' hate. He knew that in the cubicle next to him, 
The little woman with sandy hair toiled day in, day out, simply at tracking down and deleting from the press the names of people who had been vaporised, and were therefore considered never to have existed. There was a certain fitness in this, since her own husband had been vaporised a couple of years earlier. And a few cubicles away, a mild, ineffectual, dreamy creature named Ampleforth, with very hairy ears and a surprising talent for juggling with rhymes and meters, was engaged in producing garbled versions, definitive texts, they were called, of poems which had become ideologically offensive, but which, for one reason or another, were to be retained in the anthologies. And this hall, with its fifty workers or thereabouts, was only one subsection, a single cell, as it were, in the huge complexity of the records department. Beyond, above, below, were other swarms of workers, engaged in an unimaginable multitude of jobs. There were the huge printing shops with their sub-editors, their typography experts, and their elaborately equipped studios for the faking of photographs. There were the teleprogram section with its engineers, its producers, and its team of actors, specially chosen for their skill in imitating voices. There were the armies of reference clerks whose job was simply to draw up lists of books and periodicals which were due for recall. There were the vast repositories where the corrected documents were stored, and the hidden furnaces where the original copies were destroyed. And somewhere or other, quite anonymous, there were the directing brains who coordinated the whole effort, and laid down the lines of policy which made it necessary that this fragment of the past should be preserved, and that one falsified, and the other rubbed out of existence. And the records department, after all, was itself only a single branch of the Ministry of Truth, whose primary job was not to reconstruct the past, but to supply the citizens of Oceania with newspapers, films, textbooks, telescreen programs, plays, novels, with every conceivable kind of information, instruction, or entertainment, from a statue to a slogan, from a lyric poem to a biological treatise, and from a child's spelling book to a new speak dictionary. And the Ministry had not only to supply the multifarious needs of the party, but also to repeat the whole operation at a lower level, for the benefit of the proletariat. There was a whole chain of separate departments dealing with proletarian literature, music, drama, and entertainment generally. Here were produced rubbishy newspapers containing almost nothing except sport, crime, and astrology, sensational five-cent novelettes, films oozing with sex, and sentimental songs which were composed entirely by mechanical means on a special kind of kaleidoscope, known as a versificator. There was even a whole subsection, porno sec, it was called in Newspeak, which was sent out in sealed packets, and which no party member, other than those who worked on it, was permitted to look at. Three messages had slid out of the pneumatic tube while Winston was working, but they were simple matters, and he had disposed of them before the two minutes hate interrupted him. When the hate was over, he returned to his cubicle, took the Newspeak dictionary from the shelf, pushed the speak right to one side, cleaned his spectacles, and settled down to his main job of the morning. Winston's greatest pleasure in life was in his work. Most of it was a tedious routine, but included in it there were also jobs so difficult and intricate that you could lose yourself in them as in the depths of a mathematical problem delicate pieces of forgery in which you had nothing to guide you except your knowledge of the principles of Ingsoc and your estimates of what the party wanted you to say. Winston was good at this kind of thing. On occasion, he had even been entrusted with the rectification of the Times' leading articles, which were written entirely in Newspeak. He enrolled the message that he had set aside earlier. It ran, Times, 3.12.83. Reporting BB Day Order Double Plus Ungood Refs Unpersons Rewrite Fullwise Upsub Antifiling. In Old Speak, or Standard English, 
this might be rendered. The reporting of Big Brother's order for the day in the Times of December 3rd, 1983 is extremely unsatisfactory and makes references to non-existent persons. Rewrite it in full and submit your draft to higher authority before filing. Winston read through the offending article. Big Brother's order of the day, it seemed, had been chiefly devoted to praising the work of an organisation known as FFCC, which supplied cigarettes and other comforts to the sailors in the floating fortresses. A certain Comrade Withers, a prominent member of the inner party, had been singled out for special mention and awarded a decoration, the Order of Conspicuous Merit, Second Class. Three months later, FFCC had suddenly been dissolved with no reasons given. One could assume that Withers and his associates were now in disgrace, but there had been no report of the matter in the press or on the telescreen. That was to be expected, since it was unusual for political offenders to be put on trial or even publicly denounced. The great purges involving thousands of people with public trials of traitors and thought criminals who made abject confession of their crimes and were afterwards executed were special showpieces, not occurring oftener than once in a couple of years. More commonly, people who had occurred the displeasure of the party simply disappeared and were never heard of again. One never had the smallest clue as to what had happened to them. In some cases, they might not even be dead. Perhaps thirty people personally known to Winston, not counting his parents, had disappeared at one time or another. Winston stroked his nose gently with a paper clip. In the cubicle across the way, Comrade Tillotson was still crouching secretively over his speak right. He raised his head for a moment. Again, the hostile spectacle flashed. Winston wondered whether Comrade Tillotson was engaged on the same job as himself. It was perfectly possible. So tricky a piece of work would never be entrusted to a single person. On the other hand, to turn it over to a committee would be to admit openly that an act of fabrication was taking place. Very likely, as many as a dozen people were now working away on rival versions of what Big Brother had actually said. And presently, some master brain in the inner party would select this version or that, would re-edit it, and set in motion the complex processes of cross-referencing that would be required, and then the chosen lie would pass into the permanent records and become truth. Winston did not know why Withers had been disgraced. Perhaps it was for corruption or incompetence. Perhaps Big Brother was merely getting rid of a too popular subordinate. Perhaps Withers or someone close to him had been suspected of heretical tendencies. Or perhaps, what was likeliest of all, the thing had simply happened because purges and vaporizations were a necessary part of the mechanics of government. The only real clue lay in the words, refs unpersons, which indicated that Withers was already dead. You could not invariably assume that this was to be the case when people were arrested. Sometimes they were released and allowed to remain at liberty for as much as a year or two years before being executed. Very occasionally, some person whom you had believed dead long since would make a ghostly reappearance at some public trial where he would implicate hundreds of others by his testimony before vanishing, this time forever. Withers, however, was already an unperson. He did not exist. He had never existed. Winston decided that it would not be enough simply to reverse the tendency of Big Brother's speech. It was better to make it deal with something totally unconnected with its original subject. He might turn the speech into the usual denunciation of traitors and thought criminals, but that was a little too obvious. While to invent a victory at the front or some triumph of overproduction in the ninth three-year plan might complicate the records too much. What was needed was a piece of pure fantasy. Suddenly there sprang into his mind, ready-made as it were, the image of a certain 
Comrade Ogilvy, who had recently died in battle in heroic circumstances. There were occasions when Big Brother devoted his order for the day to commemorating some humble, rank-and-file party member whose life and death he held up as an example worthy to be followed. Today, he should commemorate Comrade Ogilvy. It was true that there was no such person as Comrade Ogilvy, but a few lines of print and a couple of faked photographs would soon bring him into existence. Winston thought for a moment, then pulled the speakwright towards him and began dictating in Big Brother's familiar style, a style at once military and pedantic, and because of a trick of asking questions and then promptly answering them, What lessons do we learn from this fact, comrades? The lesson, which is also one of the fundamental principles of Ingsoc? That, etc., etc. Easy to imitate. At the age of three, Comrade Ogilvy had refused all toys except a drum, a submachine gun, and a model helicopter. At six, a year early, by a special relaxation of the rules, he had joined the spies. At nine, he had been a troop leader. At eleven, he had denounced his uncle to the thought police, after overhearing a conversation which appeared to him to have criminal tendencies. At seventeen, he had been a district organiser of the Junior Anti-Sex League. At nineteen, he had designed a hand grenade which had been adopted by the Ministry of Peace and which, at its first trial, had killed thirty-one Eurasian prisoners in one burst. At twenty-three, he had perished in action. Pursued by enemy jet planes while flying over the Indian Ocean with important dispatches, he had weighted his body with his machine gun and leapt out of the helicopter into deep water, dispatches and all. An end, said Big Brother, which it was impossible to contemplate without feelings of envy. Big Brother added a few remarks on the purity and single-mindedness of Comrade Ogilvy's life. He was a total abstainer, and a non-smoker, had no recreations except a daily hour in the gymnasium, and had taken a vow of celibacy, believing marriage and the care of a family to be incompatible with a -a twenty-four-hour-a-day devotion to duty. He had no subjects of conversation except the principles of Ingsoc, and no aim in life except the defeat of the Eurasian enemy and the hunting down of spies, saboteurs, thought criminals, and traitors generally. Winston debated with himself whether to award Comrade Ogilvy the Order of Conspicuous Merit. In the end, he decided against it because of the unnecessary cross-referencing that it would entail. Once again, he glanced at his rival in the opposite cubicle. Something seemed to tell him with certainty that Tillerson was busy on the same job as himself. There was no way of knowing whose job would finally be adopted, but he felt a profound conviction that it would be his own. Comrade Ogilvy, unimagined an hour ago, was now a fact. It struck him as curious that you could create dead men, but not living ones. Comrade Ogilvy, who had never existed in the present, now existed in the past. And when, once the act of forgery was forgotten, he would exist just as authentically and upon the same evidence as Charlemagne or Julius Caesar. In the low-ceilinged canteen, deep underground, the lunch queue jerked slowly forward. The room was already very full and deafeningly noisy. From the grill at the counter, the steam of stew came pouring forth, with a sour, metallic smell, which did not quite overcome the fumes of victory gin. On the far side of the room, there was a small bar, a mere hole in the wall. 
where gin could be bought at ten cents the large nip. Just the man I was looking for, said a voice at Winston's back. He turned round. It was his friend, Syme, who worked in the research department. Perhaps friend was not exactly the right word. You did not have friends nowadays. You had comrades. But there were some comrades whose society was pleasanter than that of others. Syme was a philologist, a specialist in newspeak. Indeed, he was one of the enormous team of experts now engaged in compiling the 11th edition of the Newspeak Dictionary. He was a tiny creature, smaller than Winston, with dark hair and large, protuberant eyes, at once mournful and derisive, which seemed to search your face closely while he was speaking to you. I wanted to ask you whether you'd got any razor blades, he said. Not one, said Winston, with a sort of guilty haste. I've tried all over the place. They don't exist any longer. Everyone kept asking you for razor blades. Actually, he had two unused ones which he was hoarding up. There had been a famine of them for months past. At any given moment, there was some necessary article which the party shops were unable to supply. Sometimes it was buttons, sometimes it was darning wool, sometimes it was shoelaces. At present, it was razor blades. You could only get a hold of them, if at all, by scrounging more or less furtively on the free market. I've been using the same blade for six weeks, he added untruthfully. The queue gave another jerk forward. As they halted, he turned and faced Syme again. Each of them took a greasy metal tray from a pile at the end of the counter. Did you go and see the prisoners hanged yesterday? said Syme. I was working, said Winston indifferently. I shall see it on the flicks, I suppose. A very inadequate substitute, said Syme. His mocking eyes roved over Winston's face. I know you, the eyes seemed to say. I see through you. I know very well you didn't go to see the prisoners hanged. In an intellectual way, Syme was venomously orthodox. He would talk with a disagreeable, gloating satisfaction of helicopter raids on enemy villages and trials and confessions of thought criminals, the executions in the cellars of the Ministry of Love. Talking to him was largely a matter of getting him away from such subjects and entangling him, if possible, in the technicalities of newspeak, on which he was authoritative and interesting. Winston turned his head a little aside to avoid the scrutiny of the large, dark eyes. It was a good hanging, said Syme reminiscently. I think it spoils it when they tie their feet together. I like to see them kicking. And above all, at the end, the tongue sticking right out and blue. A quite bright blue. That's the detail that appeals to me. Next, please, yelled the white-aproned prowl with the ladle. Winston and Syme pushed their trays beneath the grill. Onto each was dumped swiftly the regulation lunch. A metal pannikin of pinkish-grey stew, a hunk of bread, a cube of cheese, a mug of milkless victory coffee, and one saccharine tablet. There's a table over there, under that telescreen, said Sam. Let's pick up a gin on the way. The gin was served out to them in handleless china mugs. They threaded their way across the crowded room and unpacked their trays onto the metal-topped table, on one corner of which someone had left a pool of stew, a filthy, liquid mess that had the appearance of vomit. Winston took up his mug of gin, paused for an instant to collect his nerve, and gulped the oily-tasting stuff down. When he had winked the tears out of his eyes, he suddenly discovered that he was hungry. He began swallowing spoonfuls of the stew, which, in among its general sloppiness, had cubes of spongy pinkish stuff, which was probably a preparation of meat. Neither of them spoke again till they had emptied their pannikins. From the table at Winston's left, a little behind his back, someone was talking rapidly and continuously, a harsh gabble, almost like the quacking of a duck which pierced the general uproar of the room. 
How is the dictionary getting on? said Winston, raising his voice to overcome the noise. Slowly, said Syme. I'm on the adjectives. It's fascinating. He had brightened up immediately at the mention of Newspeak. He pushed his pannikin aside, took up his hunk of bread in one delicate hand and his cheese in the other, and leaned across the table so as to be able to speak without shouting. The eleventh edition is the definitive edition, he said. We're getting the language into its final shape. The shape it's going to have when nobody speaks anything else. When we've finished with it, people like you will have to learn it all over again. You think, I dare say, that our chief job is inventing new words. But not a bit of it. We're destroying words. Scores of them. Hundreds of them every day. We're cutting the language down to the bone. The eleventh edition won't contain a single word that will become obsolete before the year 2050. He bit hungrily into his bread and swallowed a couple of mouthfuls, then continued speaking with a sort of pedant's passion. His thin, dark face had become animated. His eyes had lost their mocking expression and grown almost dreamy. It's a beautiful thing, the destruction of words. Of course the great wastage is in the verbs and adjectives, but there are hundreds of nouns that can be got rid of as well. It isn't only the synonyms, there are also the antonyms. After all, what justification is there for a word which is simply the opposite of some other word? A word contains its opposite in itself. Take good, for instance. If you have a word like good, what need is there for a word like bad? Ungood will do just as well. Better, because it's an exact opposite, which the other is not. Or again, if, if you want a stronger version of good, what sense is there in having a whole string of vague useless words like excellent and splendid and all the rest of them? Plus good covers the meaning. Or double plus good if you want something stronger still. Of course, we use those forms already, but in the final version of Newspeak there'll be nothing else. In the end, the whole notion of goodness and badness will be covered by only six words. In reality, only one word. Don't you see the beauty of that, Winston? It was B.B.'s idea originally, of course, he added as an afterthought. A sort of vapid eagerness flitted across Winston's face at the mention of Big Brother. Nevertheless, Syme immediately detected a certain lack of enthusiasm. You haven't a real appreciation of Newspeak, Winston, he said, almost sadly. Even when you write it, you're still thinking in old speak. I've read some of those pieces that you write in the Times occasionally. They're good enough, but they're translations. In your heart, you'd prefer to stick to old speak, with all its vagueness and useless shades of meaning. You don't grasp the beauty of the destruction of words. Do you know that Newspeak is the only language in the world whose vocabulary gets smaller every year? Winston did know that, of course. He smiled sympathetically, he hoped, not trusting himself to speak. Syme bit off another fragment of the dark-coloured bread, chewed it briefly, and went on. Don't you see that the whole aim of Newspeak is to narrow the range of thought? In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible, because there will be no words in which to express it. Every concept that can ever be needed will be expressed by exactly one word, with its meaning rigidly defined and all its subsidiary meanings rubbed out and forgotten. Already in the 11th edition, we're not far from that point, but the process will still be continuing long after you and I are dead. Every year, fewer and fewer words, and the range of consciousness always a little smaller. Even now, of course, there's no reason or excuse for committing thought crime. It's merely a question of self-discipline. Reality control. But in the end, there won't be any need even for that. The revolution will be complete when the language is perfect. Newspeak is Ingsoc, and Ingsoc is Newspeak, he added, with a sort of mystical satisfaction. Has it ever occurred to you, Winston, that by the year 2050, at the very latest, 
Not a single human being will be alive who could understand such a conversation as we are having now. Except, began Winston doubtfully, and he stopped. It had been on the tip of his tongue to say, except the proles, but he checked himself, not feeling fully certain that this remark was not in some way unorthodox. Syme, however, had divined what he was about to say. The proles are not human beings, he said carelessly. By 2050, earlier probably, all real knowledge of old speak will have disappeared. The whole literature of the past will have been destroyed. Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, Byron, they'll exist only in new speak versions. Not merely changed into something different, but actually changed into something contradictory of what they used to be. Even the literature of the party will change. Even the slogans will change. How could you have a slogan like freedom is slavery when the concept of freedom has been abolished? The whole climate of thought will be different. In fact, there will be no thought as we understand it now. Orthodoxy means not thinking. Not needing to think. Orthodoxy is unconsciousness. One of these days, thought Winston, with sudden, deep conviction, Syme will be vaporised. He is too intelligent. He sees too clearly and speaks too plainly. The party does not like such people. One day he will disappear. It is written in his face. Winston had finished his bread and cheese. He turned a little sideways in his chair to drink his mug of coffee. At the table on his left, the man with the strident voice was still talking remorselessly away. A young woman who was perhaps his secretary, and who was sitting with her back to Winston, was listening to him and seemed to be eagerly agreeing with everything that he said. From time to time, Winston caught some such remark as, I think you're so right. I do so agree with you uttered in a youthful and rather silly feminine voice. But the other voice never stopped for an instant, even when the girl was speaking. Winston knew the man by sight, though he knew no more about him than that he held some important post in the fiction department. He was a man of about thirty, with a muscular throat and a large mobile mouth. His head was thrown back a little, and because of the angle at which he was sitting, his spectacles caught the light and presented to Winston two blank discs instead of eyes. What was slightly horrible was that from the stream of sound that poured out of his mouth, it was almost impossible to distinguish a single word. Just once, Winston caught a phrase, complete and final elimination of Goldsteinism, jerked out very rapidly, and as it seemed, all in one piece like a line of type cast solid. For the rest of it, it was just a noise, a quack, quack, quacking. And yet, though you could not actually hear what the man was saying, you could be in no doubt about its general nature. He might be denouncing Goldstein and demanding sterner measures against thought criminals and saboteurs. He might be fulminating against the atrocities of the Eurasian army, he might be praising Big Brother or the heroes on the Malabar front. It made no difference. Whatever it was, you could be certain that every word of it was pure orthodoxy. Pure Ingsoc. As he watched the eyeless face with the jaw moving rapidly up and down, Winston had a curious feeling that this was not a real human being, but some kind of dummy. It was not the man's brain that was speaking. It was his larynx. The stuff that was coming out of him consisted of words, but it was not speech in the true sense. It was a noise uttered in unconsciousness, like the quacking of a duck. Syme had fallen silent for a moment, and with the handle of his spoon was tracing patterns in the puddle of stew. The voice from the other table quacked rapidly on, easily audible in spite of the surrounding din. There is a word in new speak, said Syme. I don't know whether you know it. Duck speak. To quack like a duck. 
It is one of those interesting words that have two contradictory meanings. Applied to an opponent, it is abuse. Applied to someone you agree with, it is praise. Unquestionably, Syme will be vaporised, Winston thought again. He thought it with a kind of sadness, although well knowing that Syme despised him and slightly disliked him, and was fully capable of denouncing him as a thought criminal if he saw any reason for doing so. There was something subtly wrong with Syme. There was something that he lacked. Discretion, aloofness, a sort of saving stupidity. You could not say that he was unorthodox. He believed in the principles of Ingsoc. He venerated Big Brother. He rejoiced over victories. He hated heretics, not merely with sincerity, but with a sort of restless zeal, an up-to-dateness of information which the ordinary party member did not approach. Yet a faint air of disreputability always clung to him. He said things that would have been better unsaid. He had read too many books. He frequented the Chestnut Tree Café, haunt of painters and musicians. There was no law, not even an unwritten law, against frequenting the Chestnut Tree Café, yet the place was somehow ill-omened. The old, discredited leaders of the party had been used to gather there, before they were finally purged. Goldstein himself, it was said, had sometimes been seen there, years and decades ago. Syme's fate was not difficult to foresee. And yet it was a fact that if Syme grasped, even for three seconds, the nature of his, Winston's, secret opinions, he would betray him instantly to the thought police. So would anybody else, for that matter. But Syme more than most. Zeal was not enough. Orthodoxy was unconsciousness. Syme looked up. Here comes Parsons, he said. Something in the tone of his voice seemed to add, that bloody fool. Parsons, Winston's fellow tenant at Victory Mansions, was in fact threading his way across the room. A tubby, middle-sized man with fair hair and a frog-like face. At thirty-five he was already putting on rolls of fat at neck and waistline, but his movements were brisk and boyish. His whole appearance was that of a little boy grown large, so much so that, although he was wearing the regulation overalls, it was almost impossible not to think of him as being dressed in the blue shorts, grey shirt and red neckerchief of the spies. In visualising him, one saw always a picture of dimpled knees and sleeves rolled back from pudgy forearms. Parsons did, indeed, invariably revert to shorts when a community hike or any other physical activity gave him an excuse for doing so. He greeted them both with a cheery, Hello, hello, and sat down at the table, giving off an intense smell of sweat. Beads of moisture stood out all over his pink face. His powers of sweating were extraordinary. At the community centre you could always tell when he had been playing table tennis by the dampness of the bat handle. Syme had produced a strip of paper on which there was a long column of words, and was studying it with an ink pencil between his fingers. "'Look at him working away in the lunch hour,' said Parsons, nudging Winston. "'Keenness, eh? What's that that you've got there, old boy? Something a bit too brainy for me, I expect. Smith, old boy, I'll tell you why I'm chasing you. It's that sub you forgot to give me.' "'Which sub is that?' said Winston automatically feeling for money. About a quarter of one's salary had to be earmarked for voluntary subscriptions, which were so numerous that it was difficult to keep track of them. For hate week! You know, the house by house fund. I'm treasurer for our block. We're making an all-out effort, going to put on a tremendous show. I tell you, it won't be my fault if old Victory Mansions doesn't have the biggest outfit of flags in the whole street. Two dollars! You promised me. Winston found and handed over two creased and filthy notes, which Parsons entered in a small notebook in the neat handwriting of the illiterate. 
By the way, old boy, he said, I hear that little beggar of mine let fly at you with his catapult yesterday. I gave him a good dressing down for it. In fact, I told him I'd take the catapult away if he does it again. I think he was a little upset at not going to the execution, said Winston. Ah, well, what I mean to say shows the right spirit, doesn't it? Mischievous little beggars they are, both of them. <laughs> but talk about keenness. All they think about is the spies, and the war, of course. Do you know what that little girl of mine did last Saturday when her troop was on a hike out Berkhamstead way? She got two other girls to go with her, slipped off from the hike and spent the whole afternoon following a strange man. They kept on his trail for two hours, right through the woods, and then, when they got into Ambersham, handed him over to the patrols. What did they do that for? said Winston, somewhat taken aback. Parsons went on triumphantly. My kid made sure he was some kind of enemy agent. Might have been dropped by parachute, for instance. But here's the point, old boy. What do you think put her onto him in the first place? She spotted he was wearing a funny kind of shoes. Said she'd never seen anyone wearing shoes like that before. So, the chances were, he was a foreigner. <laughs> Pretty smart for a nipper of seven, eh? What happened to the man? said Winston. Ah, that I couldn't say, of course. But I wouldn't be altogether surprised if, uh... Parsons made the motion of aiming a rifle and clicked his tongue for the explosion. Good, said Syme abstractedly, without looking up from his strip of paper. Of course we can't afford to take chances, agreed Winston dutifully. What I mean to say, there is a war on, said Parsons. As though in confirmation of this, a trumpet call floated from the telescreen just above their heads. However, it was not the proclamation of a military victory this time, but merely an announcement from the Ministry of Plenty. Comrades! cried an eager, youthful voice. Attention, comrades! We have glorious news for you. We have won the battle for production. Returns now completed of the output of all classes of consumption goods show that the standard of living has risen by no less than 20% over the past year. All over Oceania this morning there were irrepressible, spontaneous demonstrations when workers marched out of factories and offices and paraded through the streets with banners voicing their gratitude to Big Brother for the new happy life which his wise leadership has bestowed upon us. Here are some of the completed figures. Foodstuffs? The phrase, our new happy life, recurred several times. It had been a favourite of late with the Ministry of Plenty. Parsons, his attention caught by the trumpet call, sat listening with a sort of gaping solemnity, a sort of edified boredom. He could not follow the figures, but he was aware that they were in some way a cause for satisfaction. He had lugged out a huge and filthy pipe which was already half full of charred tobacco. With the tobacco ration at a hundred grams a week, it was seldom possible to fill a pipe to the top. Winston was smoking a victory cigarette, which he held carefully horizontal. The new ration did not start till tomorrow, and he had only four cigarettes left. For the moment he had to shut his ears to the remoter noises and was listening to the stuff that streamed out of the telescreen. It appeared that there had even been demonstrations to thank Big Brother for raising the chocolate ration to 20 grams a week. And only yesterday, he reflected, it had been announced that the ration was to be reduced to 20 grams a week. Was it possible that they could swallow that? After only 24 hours... Yes, they swallowed it. Parsons swallowed it easily, with the stupidity of an animal. 
The eyeless creature at the other table swallowed it fanatically, passionately, with a furious desire to track down, denounce, and vaporize anyone who should suggest that last week the ration had been 30 grams. Syme, too, in some more complex way, involving double think, Syme swallowed it. Was he, then, alone in the possession of a memory? The fabulous statistics continued to pour out of the telescreen. As compared with last year, there was more food, more clothes, more houses, more furniture, more cooking pots, more fuel, more ships, more helicopters, more books, more babies. More of everything except disease, crime, and insanity. Year by year and minute by minute, everybody and everything was whizzing rapidly upwards. As Syme had done earlier, Winston had taken up his spoon and was dabbling in the pale-coloured gravy that dribbled across the table, drawing a long streak of it out into a pattern. He meditated resentfully on the physical texture of life. Had it always been like this? Had food always tasted like this? He looked round the canteen. A low-ceilinged, crowded room, its walls grimy from the contact of innumerable bodies. Battered metal tables and chairs placed so close together that you sat with elbows touching. Bent spoons, dented trays, coarse white mugs. All surfaces greasy, grime in every crack and a sourish, composite smell of bad gin and bad coffee and metallic stew and dirty clothes. Always in your stomach and in your skin, there was a sort of protest, a feeling that you had been cheated of something that you had a right to. It was true that he had no memories of anything greatly different. In any time that he could accurately remember, there had never been quite enough to eat. One had never had socks or underclothes that were not full of holes. Furniture had always been battered and rickety, rooms underheated, tube trains crowded, houses falling to pieces, bread dark-coloured, tea a rarity, coffee filthy-tasting, cigarettes insufficient. Nothing cheap and plentiful except synthetic gin. And though, of course, it grew worse as one's body aged, was it not a sign that this was not the natural order of things, if one's heart sickened at the discomfort and dirt and scarcity, the interminable winters, the stickiness of one's socks, the lifts that never worked, the cold water, the gritty soap, the cigarettes that came to pieces, the food with its strange, evil tastes. Why should one feel it to be intolerable unless one had some kind of ancestral memory that things had once been different? He looked round the canteen again. Nearly everyone was ugly and would still have been ugly even if dressed otherwise than in the uniform blue overalls. On the far side of the room, sitting at a table alone, a small, curiously beetle-like man was drinking a cup of coffee, his little eyes darting suspicious glances from side to side. How easy it was, thought Winston, if you did not look about you, to believe that the physical type set up by the party as an ideal Tall, muscular youths and deep-bosomed maidens, blonde-haired, vital, sunburnt, carefree, existed and even predominated. Actually, so far as he could judge, the majority of people in Airstrip 1 were small, dark and ill-favoured. It was curious how that beetle-like type proliferated in the ministries. Little dumpy men growing stout very early in life, with short legs, swift scuttling movements, and fat, inscrutable faces with very small eyes. It was the type that seemed to flourish best under the dominion of the party. 
The announcement from the Ministry of Plenty ended on another trumpet call and gave way to tinny music. Parsons, stirred to vague enthusiasm by the bombardment of figures, took his pipe out of his mouth. The Ministry of Plenty's certainly done a good job this year, he said with a knowing shake of his head. By the way, Smith, old boy, I suppose you haven't got any razor blades you can let me have? Not one, said Winston. I've been using the same blade for six weeks myself. Ah, well, just thought I'd ask you, old boy. Sorry, said Winston. The quacking voice from the next table, temporarily silenced during the minister's announcement, had started up again, as loud as ever. For some reason, Winston suddenly found himself thinking of Mrs. Parsons, with her wispy hair and the dust in the creases of her face. Within two years, those children would be denouncing her to the thought police. Mrs. Parsons would be vaporised. Syme would be vaporised. Winston would be vaporised. O'Brien would be vaporised. Parsons, on the other hand, would never be vaporised. The eyeless creature with the quacking voice would never be vaporised. The little, beetle-like men who scuttle so nimbly through the labyrinthine corridors of ministries, they too would never be vaporised. And the girl with dark hair, the girl from the fiction department, she would never be vaporised either. It seemed to him that he knew instinctively who would survive and who would perish, though just what it was that made for survival, it was not easy to say. At this moment he was dragged out of his reverie with a violent jerk. The girl at the next table had turned partly round and was looking at him. It was the girl with dark hair. She was looking at him in a sidelong way, but with curious intensity. The instant she caught his eye, she looked away again. The sweat started out on Winston's backbone. A horrible pang of terror went through him. It was gone almost at once, but it left a sort of nagging uneasiness behind. Why was she watching him? Why did she keep following him about? Unfortunately, he could not remember whether she had already been at the table when he arrived, or had come there afterwards. But yesterday, at any rate, during the two minutes' hate, she had sat immediately behind him when there was no apparent need to do so. Quite likely her real object had been to listen to him, and make sure whether he was shouting loudly enough. His earlier thought returned to him. Probably she was not actually a member of the Thought Police, but then it was precisely the amateur spy who was the greatest danger of all. He did not know how long she had been looking at him, but perhaps for as much as five minutes, and it was possible that his features had not been perfectly under control. It was terribly dangerous to let your thoughts wander when you were in any public place or within range of a telescreen. The smallest thing could give you away. A nervous tick, an unconscious look of anxiety, a habit of muttering to yourself. Anything that carried with it the suggestion of abnormality, of having something to hide. In any case, to wear an improper expression on your face, to look incredulous when a victory was announced, for example, was itself a punishable offence. There was even a word for it in Newspeak. Face crime, it was called. The girl had turned her back on him again. Perhaps, after all, she was not really following him about. Perhaps it was coincidence that she had sat so close to him two days running. His cigarette had gone out, and he laid it carefully on the edge of the table. He would finish smoking it after work, if he could keep the tobacco in it. Quite likely the person at the next table was a spy of the Thought Police, and... Quite likely he would be in the cellars of the Ministry of Love within three days. But a cigarette end must not be wasted. Syme had folded up his strip of paper and stowed it away in his pocket. Parsons had begun talking again. Did I ever tell you, old boy, he said, chuckling round the stem of his pipe, about the time when those two nippers of mine set fire to the old market woman's skirt because <laughs> because they saw her wrapping up sausages in a poster of B.B. Sneaked up behind her and set fire to it with a box of matches. <laughs> Burned her quite badly, I believe. 
Ah, oh, little beggars, eh? But keen as mustard. That's a first-rate training they give them in the spies nowadays. Better than in my day, even. What do you think's the latest thing they've served them out with? Ear trumpets for listening through keyholes. My little girl brought one home the other night, tried it out on our sitting room door, and reckoned she could hear twice as much as with her ear to the hall. Of course it's only a toy, mind you. Still, gives them the right idea, eh? At this moment, the telescreen let out a piercing whistle. It was the signal to return to work. All three men sprang to their feet to join in the struggle round the lifts, and the remaining tobacco fell out of Winston's cigarette. Winston was writing in his diary. It was three years ago. It was on a dark evening, in a narrow side street near one of the big railway stations. She was standing near a doorway in the wall, under a street lamp that hardly gave any light. She had a young face, painted very thick. It was really the paint that appealed to me, the whiteness of it like a mask, and the bright red lips. Party women never paint their faces. There was nobody else in the street, and no telescreens. She said two dollars. I... For the moment, it was too difficult to go on. He shut his eyes and pressed his fingers against them, trying to squeeze out the vision that kept recurring. He had an almost overwhelming temptation to shout a string of filthy words at the top of his voice, or to bang his head against the wall, to kick over the table and hurl the ink pot through the window, to do any violent or noisy or painful thing that might black out the memory that was tormenting him. Your worst enemy, he reflected, was your own nervous system. At any moment, the tension inside you was liable to translate itself into some visible symptom. He thought of a man whom he had passed in the street a few weeks back. A quite ordinary-looking man, a party member, aged thirty-five to forty, tallish and thin, carrying a briefcase. They were a few metres apart when the left side of the man's face was suddenly contorted by a sort of spasm. It happened again just as they were passing one another. It was only a twitch, a quiver. Rapid as the clicking of a camera shutter, but obviously habitual. He remembered thinking at the time, That poor devil is done for. And what was frightening was that the action was quite possibly unconscious. The most deadly danger of all was talking in your sleep. There was no way of guarding against that, so far as he could see. He drew his breath and went on writing. I went with her through the doorway and across a backyard into a basement kitchen. There was a bed against the wall, and a lamp on the table turned down very low. She... His teeth were set on edge. He would have liked to spit. Simultaneously with the woman in the basement kitchen, he thought of Catherine, his wife. Winston was married. Had been married, at any rate. Probably he still was married. So far as he knew, his wife was not dead. He seemed to breathe again the warm, stuffy odour of the basement kitchen. An odour compounded of bugs and dirty clothes and villainous cheap scent, but nevertheless alluring because no woman of the party ever used scent or could be imagined as doing so. Only the proles used scent. In his mind, the smell of it was inextricably mixed up with fornication. When he had gone with that woman, it had been his first lapse in two years or thereabouts. 
Consorting with prostitutes was forbidden, of course, but it was one of those rules that you could occasionally nerve yourself to break. It was dangerous, but it was not a life-and-death matter. To be caught with a prostitute might mean five years in a forced labour camp, not more if you had committed no other offence. And it was easy enough, provided that you could avoid being caught in the act. The poorer quarters swarmed with women who were ready to sell themselves. Some could even be purchased for a bottle of gin, which the proles were not supposed to drink. Tacitly, the party was even inclined to encourage prostitution, as an outlet for instincts which could not be altogether suppressed. Mere debauchery did not matter very much, so long as it was furtive and joyless, and only involved the women of a submerged and despised class. The unforgivable crime was promiscuity between party members. But, though this was one of the crimes that the accused in the Great Purges invariably confessed to, it was difficult to imagine any such thing actually happening. The aim of the party was not merely to prevent men and women from forming loyalties which it might not be able to control. Its real, undeclared purpose was to remove all pleasure from the sexual act. Not love so much as eroticism was the enemy, inside marriage as well as outside it. All marriages between party members had to be approved by a committee appointed for the purpose, and... Though the principle was never clearly stated, permission was always refused if the couple concerned gave the impression of being physically attracted to one another. The only recognised purpose of marriage was to beget children for the service of the party. Sexual intercourse was to be looked on as a slightly disgusting minor operation, like having an enema. This again was never put into plain words but in an indirect way it was rubbed into every party member from childhood onwards. There were even organisations such as the Junior Anti-Sex League, which advocated complete celibacy for both sexes. All children were to be gotten by artificial insemination, art sam, it was called in Newspeak, and brought up in public institutions. This, Winston was aware, was not meant altogether seriously, but somehow it fitted in with the general ideology of the party. The party was trying to kill the sex instinct, or if it could not be killed, then to distort it and dirty it. He did not know why this was, but it seemed natural that it should be so. And as far as the women were concerned, the party's efforts were largely successful. He thought again of Catherine, it must be nine, ten, nearly eleven years since they had parted. It was curious how seldom he thought of her. For days at a time he was capable of forgetting that he had ever been married. They had only been together for about fifteen months. The party did not permit divorce, but it rather encouraged separation in cases where there were no children. Catherine was a tall, fair-haired girl, very straight, with splendid movements. She had a bold, aquiline face, a face that one might have called noble, until one discovered that there was as nearly as possible nothing behind it. Very early in her married life he had decided, though perhaps it was only that he knew her more intimately than he knew most people, that she had without exception the most stupid, vulgar, empty mind that he had ever encountered. She had not a thought in her head that was not a slogan, and there was no imbecility, absolutely none, that she was not capable of swallowing if the party handed it out to her. The human soundtrack, he nicknamed her in his own mind. Yet he could have endured living with her if it had not been for just one thing. Sex. As soon as he touched her, she seemed to wince and stiffen. To embrace her was like embracing a jointed wooden image, 
And what was strange was that even when she was clasping him against her, he had the feeling that she was simultaneously pushing him away with all her strength. The rigidity of her muscles managed to convey that impression. She would lie there with shut eyes, neither resisting nor cooperating, but submitting. It was extraordinarily embarrassing, and after a while, horrible. But even then he could have borne living with her if it had been agreed that she should remain celibate. But curiously enough, it was Catherine who refused this. They must, she said, produce a child if they could. So the performance continued to happen, once a week, quite regularly, whenever it was not impossible. She even used to remind him of it in the morning, of something which had to be done that evening and which must not be forgotten. She had two names for it. One was making a baby, and the other was our duty to the party. Yes, she had actually used that phrase. Quite soon he grew to have a feeling of positive dread when the appointed day came round. But luckily no child appeared, and in the end she agreed to give up trying, and soon afterwards they parted. Winston sighed inaudibly. He picked up his pen again and wrote, She threw herself down on the bed, and at once, without any kind of preliminary in the most coarse, horrible way you can imagine, pulled up her skirt. I... He saw himself standing there in the dim lamplight, with the smell of bugs and cheap scent in his nostrils, and in his heart a feeling of defeat and resentment, which even at that moment was mixed up with the thought of Catherine's white body, frozen forever by the hypnotic power of the party. Why did it always have to be like this? Why could he not have a woman of his own instead of these filthy scuffles at intervals of years? But a real love affair was an almost unthinkable event. The women of the party were all alike. Chastity was as deep ingrained in them as party loyalty. By careful early conditioning, by games and cold water, by the rubbish that was dinned into them at school and in the spies and the youth league, by lectures, parades, songs, slogans and martial music, the natural feeling had been driven out of them. His reason told him that there must be exceptions, but his heart did not believe it. They were all impregnable, as the party intended that they should be. And what he wanted, more even than to be loved, was to break down that wall of virtue. Even if it were only once in his whole life, the sexual act successfully performed was rebellion. Desire was thought crime. Even to have awakened Catherine, if he could have achieved it, would have been like a seduction, although she was his wife. But the rest of the story had got to be written down. He wrote, I turned up the lamp. When I saw her in the light, after the darkness, the feeble light of the paraffin lamp had seemed very bright. For the first time he could see the woman properly. He had taken a step towards her, and then halted, full of lust and terror. He was painfully conscious of the risk he had taken in coming here. It was perfectly possible that the patrols would catch him on the way out, for that matter, they might be waiting outside the door at this moment. If he went away without even doing what he had come here to do... It had got to be written down. It had got to be confessed. What he had suddenly seen in the lamplight was that the woman was... 
old. The paint was plastered so thick on her face that it looked as though it might crack like a cardboard mask. There were streaks of white in her hair. But the truly dreadful detail was that her mouth had fallen a little open, revealing nothing except a cavernous blackness. She had no teeth at all. He wrote hurriedly, in scrabbling handwriting. When I saw her in the light, she was quite an old woman, fifty years old at least. But I went ahead and did it just the same. He pressed his fingers against his eyelids again. He had written it down at last. But it made no difference. The therapy had not worked. The urge to shout filthy words at the top of his voice was as strong as ever. If there is hope, wrote Winston, it lies in the proles. If there was hope, it must lie in the proles, because only there, in those swarming, disregarded masses, 85% of the population of Oceania, could the force to destroy the party ever be generated. The party could not be overthrown from within. Its enemies, if it had any enemies, had no way of coming together or even of identifying one another. Even if the legendary Brotherhood existed, as just possibly it might, it was inconceivable that its members could ever assemble in larger numbers than twos and threes. Rebellion meant a look in the eyes, an inflection of the voice, at the most, an occasional whispered word. But the proles, if only they could somehow become conscious of their own strength, would have no need to conspire. They needed only to rise up and shake themselves like a horse shaking off flies. If they chose, they could blow the party to pieces tomorrow morning. Surely, sooner or later, it must occur to them to do it. And yet... He remembered how once he had been walking down a crowded street, when a tremendous shout of hundreds of voices, women's voices, had burst from a side street a little way ahead. It was a great, formidable cry of anger and despair, a deep, loud, that went humming on like the reverberation of a bell. His heart had leapt. It started, he had thought. A riot! The proles are breaking loose at last! When he had reached the spot, it was to see a mob of two or three hundred women crowding round the stalls of a street market, with faces as tragic as though they had been the doomed passengers on a sinking ship. But at this moment, the general despair broke down into a multitude of individual quarrels. It appeared that one of the stalls had been selling tin saucepans. They were wretched, flimsy things, but cooking pots of any kind were always difficult to get. Now the supply had unexpectedly given out. The successful women, bumped and jostled by the rest, were trying to make off with the saucepans while dozens of others clamoured round the stall, accusing the stallkeeper of favouritism and of having more saucepans somewhere in reserve. There was a fresh outburst of yells. Two bloated women, one of them with her hair coming down, had got hold of the same saucepan and were trying to tear it out of one another's hands. For a moment they were both tugging, and then the handle came off. Winston watched them disgustedly. And yet, just for a moment, what almost Frightening power had sounded in that cry from only a few hundred throats. 
Why was it that they could never shout like that about anything that mattered? He wrote, Until they become conscious, they will never rebel. And until after they have rebelled, they cannot become conscious. That, he reflected, might almost have been a transcription from one of the party textbooks. The party claimed, of course, to have liberated the proles from bondage. Before the revolution, they had been hideously oppressed by the capitalists. They'd been starved and flogged. Women had been forced to work in the coal mines. Women still did work in the coal mines, as a matter of fact. Children had been sold into the factories at the age of six. But simultaneously, true to the principles of doublethink, the party taught that the proles were natural inferiors, who must be kept in subjection like animals by the application of a few simple rules. In reality, very little was known about the proles. It was not necessary to know much. So long as they continued to work and breed, their other activities were without importance. Left to themselves, like cattle turned loose upon the plains of Argentina, they had reverted to a style of life that appeared to be natural to them. A sort of ancestral pattern. They were born, they grew up in the gutters, they went to work at twelve, they passed through a brief blossoming period of beauty and sexual desire, they married at twenty, they were middle-aged at thirty, they died, for the most part, at sixty. Heavy physical work, the care of home and children, petty quarrels with neighbours, films, football, beer, and above all, gambling, filled up the horizon of their minds. To keep them in control was not difficult. A few agents of the thought police moved always among them, spreading false rumours and marking down and eliminating the few individuals who were judged capable of becoming dangerous. But no attempt was made to indoctrinate them with the ideology of the party. It was not desirable that the proles should have strong political feelings. All that was required of them was a primitive patriotism, which could be appealed to whenever it was necessary to make them accept longer working hours or shorter rations. And even when they became discontented, as they sometimes did, their discontent led nowhere, because, being without general ideas, they could only focus it on petty, specific grievances. The larger evils invariably escaped their notice. The great majority of proles did not even have telescreens in their homes. Even the civil police interfered with them very little. There was a vast amount of criminality in London, a whole world within a world of thieves, bandits, prostitutes, drug peddlers and racketeers of every description, but since it all happened among the proles themselves, it was of no importance. In all questions of morals, they were allowed to follow their ancestral code. The sexual puritanism of the party was not imposed upon them. Promiscuity went unpunished. Divorce was permitted. For that matter, even religious worship would have been permitted if the proles had shown any sign of needing or wanting it. They were beneath suspicion. As the party slogan put it, Proles and animals are free. Winston reached down and cautiously scratched his varicose also. It had begun itching again. The thing you invariably came back to was the impossibility of knowing what life before the revolution had really been like. He took out of the drawer a copy of a children's history textbook which he had borrowed from Mrs. Parsons and began copying a passage into the diary. In the old days, it ran... Before the glorious revolution, London was not the beautiful city that we know today. It was a dark, dirty, miserable place, where hardly anybody had enough to eat and where hundreds and thousands of poor people had no boots on their feet and not even a roof to sleep under. Children no older than you had to work twelve hours a day for cruel masters who flogged them with whips if they worked too slowly and fed them on nothing but stale bread crusts and water. But, in among all this terrible poverty, 
there were just a few great, big, beautiful houses that were lived in by rich men, who had as many as thirty servants to look after them. These rich men were called capitalists. They were fat, ugly men with wicked faces, like the one in the picture on the opposite page. You can see that he is dressed in a long black coat which was called a frock coat, and a queer, shiny hat shaped like a stovepipe, which was called a top hat. This was the uniform of the capitalists, and no one else was allowed to wear it. The capitalists owned everything in the world, and everyone else was their slave. They owned all the land, all the houses, all the factories, and all the money. If anyone disobeyed them, they could throw them into prison, or they could take his job away and starve him to death. When any ordinary person spoke to a capitalist, he had to cringe and bow to him, and take off his cap and address him as Sir. The chief of all the capitalists was called the king, and, but he knew the rest of the catalogue. There would be the mention of the bishops in their lawn sleeves, the judges in their ermine robes, the pillory, the stocks, the treadmill, the cat -o nine tails the Lord Mayor's banquet, and the practice of kissing the Pope's toe. There was also something called the Jus Prime Noctis, which would probably not be mentioned in a textbook for children. It was the law by which every capitalist had the right to sleep with any woman working in one of his factories. How could you tell how much of it was lies? It might be true that the average human being was better off now than he had been before the revolution. The only evidence to the contrary was the mute protest in your own bones, the instinctive feeling that the conditions you lived in were intolerable, and that at some other time they must have been different. It struck him that the only characteristic thing about modern life was not its cruelty and insecurity, but simply its bareness its dinginess, its listlessness. Life, if you looked about you, bore no resemblance not only to the lies that streamed out of the telescreens, but even to the ideals that the party was trying to achieve. Great areas of it, even for a party member, were neutral and non-political, a matter of slogging through dreary jobs, fighting for a place on the tube, darning a worn-out sock, catching a saccharin tablet, saving a cigarette end. The ideal set up by the party was something huge, terrible and glittering, a world of steel and concrete, of monstrous machines and terrifying weapons, a nation of warriors and fanatics marching forward in perfect unity, all thinking the same thoughts and shouting the same slogans, perpetually working, fighting, triumphing, persecuting. Three hundred million people, all with the same face. The reality was decaying, dingy cities where underfed people shuffled to and fro in leaky shoes, in patched up nineteenth century houses that smelt always of cabbage and bad lavatories. He seemed to see a vision of London, vast and ruinous, City of a million dustbins, and mixed up with it was a picture of Mrs. Parsons, a woman with lined face and wispy hair, fiddling helplessly with a blocked waste pipe. He reached down and scratched his ankle again. Day and night, the telescreens bruised your ears with statistics, proving that people today had more food, more clothes, better houses, better recreations that they lived longer, worked shorter hours, were bigger, healthier, stronger, happier, more intelligent, better educated than the people of fifty years ago. Not a word of it could ever be proved or disproved. The party claimed, for example, that today 40% of adult proles were literate. Before the revolution, it was said the number had only been 15%. The party claimed that the infant mortality rate was now only 160 per thousand, whereas before the revolution, 
it had been three hundred. And so it went on. It was like a single equation with two unknowns. It might very well be that literally every word in the history books, even the things that one accepted without question, was pure fantasy. For all he knew, there might never have been any such law as the Jus Prime Noctis, or any such creature as a capitalist, or any such garment as a top hat. Everything faded into mist. The past was erased. The erasure was forgotten. The lie became truth. Just once in his life he had possessed, after the event, that was what counted, concrete, unmistakable evidence of an act of falsification. He had held it between his fingers for as long as 30 seconds. In 1973, it must have been. At any rate, it was about the time when he and Catherine had parted. But the really relevant date was seven or eight years earlier. The story really began in the middle 60s, the period of the Great Purges in which the original leaders of the revolution were wiped out once and for all. By 1970, none of them was left, except Big Brother himself. All the rest had by that time been exposed as traitors and counter-revolutionaries. Goldstein had fled and was hiding no one knew where, and of the others, a few had simply disappeared, while the majority had been executed after spectacular public trials at which they had made confession of their crimes. Among the last survivors were three men named Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford. It must have been in 1965 that these three had been arrested. As often happened, they had vanished for a year or more, so that one did not know whether they were alive or dead, and then had suddenly been brought forth to incriminate themselves in the usual way. They had confessed to intelligence with the enemy. At that date, too, the enemy was Eurasia. Embezzlement of public funds, the murder of various trusted party members, Intrigues against the leadership of Big Brother, which had started long before the revolution happened, and acts of sabotage causing the death of hundreds of thousands of people. After confessing to these things, they had been pardoned, reinstated in the party, and given posts which were in fact sinecures, but which sounded important. All three had written long, abject articles in the Times, analysing the reasons for their defection, and promising to make amends. Sometime after their release, Winston had actually seen all three of them in the Chestnut Tree Cafe. He remembered the sort of terrified fascination with which he had watched them out of the corner of his eye. They were men far older than himself, relics of the ancient world. Almost the last great figures left over from the heroic days of the party. The glamour of the underground struggle and the civil war still faintly clung to them. He had the feeling, though already at that time facts and dates were growing blurry, that he had known their names years earlier than he had known that of Big Brother. But also, they were outlaws, enemies, untouchables, doomed with absolute certainty to extinction within a year or two. No one who had once fallen into the hands of the Thought Police ever escaped in the end. They were corpses waiting to be sent back to the grave. There was no one at any of the tables nearest to them. It was not wise even to be seen in the neighbourhood of such people. They were sitting in silence, before glasses of the gin flavoured with cloves, which was the speciality of the cafe. Of the three, it was Rutherford whose appearance had most impressed Winston. Rutherford had once been a famous caricaturist, whose brutal cartoons had helped to inflame popular opinion before and during the revolution. 
Even now, at long intervals, his cartoons were appearing in the Times. They were simply an imitation of his earlier manner, and curiously lifeless and unconvincing. Always there were a rehashing of the ancient themes. Slum tenements, starving children, street battles, capitalists in top hats. Even on the barricades, the capitalists still seemed to cling to their top hats. An endless, hopeless effort to get back into the past. He was a monstrous man, with a mane of greasy grey hair, his face pouched and seamed with thick negroid lips. At one time he must have been immensely strong. Now his great body was sagging, sloping, bulging, falling away in every direction. He seemed to be breaking up before one's eyes, like a mountain crumbling. It was the lonely hour of fifteen. Winston could not now remember how he had come to be in the café at such a time. The place was almost empty. A tinny music was trickling from the telescreens. The three men sat in their corner, almost motionless, never speaking. Uncommanded, the waiter brought fresh glasses of gin. There was a chessboard on the table beside them, with the pieces set out, but no games started. And then, for perhaps half a minute in all, something happened to the telescreens. The tune that they were playing changed, and the tone of the music changed too. They came into it, but it was something hard to describe. It was a peculiar, cracked, braying, jeering note. In his mind, Winston called it a yellow note. And then a voice from the telescreen was singing, Under the spreading chestnut tree I sold you and you sold me There lie they and here lie we Under the spreading chestnut tree. The three men never stirred. But when Winston glanced again at Rutherford's ruinous face, he saw that his eyes were full of tears. And for the first time he noticed, with a kind of inward shudder, and yet not knowing at what he shuddered, that both Aronson and Rutherford had broken noses. A little later, all three were rearrested. It appeared that they had engaged in fresh conspiracies from the very moment of their release. At their second trial, they confessed to all their old crimes over again, with a whole string of new ones. They were executed and their fate was recorded in the party histories, a warning to posterity. About five years after this, in 1973, Winston was unrolling a wad of documents which had just flopped out of the pneumatic tube onto his desk, when he came on a fragment of paper which had evidently been slipped in among the others and then forgotten. The instant he had flattened it out, he saw its significance. It was a half-page torn out of the times of about ten years earlier, the top half of the page so that it included the date, and it contained a photograph of the delegates at some party function in New York. Prominent in the middle of the group were Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford. There was no mistaking them. In any case, their names were in the caption at the bottom. The point was that at both trials, all three men had confessed that on that date, they had been on Eurasian soil. They had flown from a secret airfield in Canada to rendezvous somewhere in Siberia, and had conferred with members of the Eurasian general staff, to whom they had betrayed important military secrets. The date had stuck in Winston's memory because it had chanced to be Midsummer Day, 
but the whole story must be on record in countless other places as well. There was only one possible conclusion. The confessions were lies. Of course, this was not in itself a discovery. Even at that time, Winston had not imagined that the people who were wiped out in the purges had actually committed the crimes that they were accused of. But this was concrete evidence. It was a fragment of the abolished past. Like a fossil bone which turns up in the wrong stratum and destroys a geological theory. It was enough to blow the party to atoms. If in some way it could have been published to the world and its significance made known. He had gone straight on working. As soon as he saw what the photograph was and what it meant, he had covered it up with another sheet of paper. Luckily, when he unrolled it, it had been upside down from the point of view of the telescreen. He took his scribbling pad on his knee and pushed back his chair so as to get as far away from the telescreen as possible. To keep your face expressionless was not difficult, and even your breathing could be controlled with an effort, but you could not control the beating of your heart and the telescreen was quite delicate enough to pick it up. He let what he judged to be ten minutes go by, tormented all the while by the fear that some accident, a sudden draught blowing across his desk, for instance, would betray him. Then, without uncovering it again, he dropped the photograph into the memory hall along with some other waste papers. Within another minute, perhaps, it would have crumbled into ashes. That was ten, eleven years ago. Today, probably he would have kept that photograph. It was curious that the fact of having held it in his fingers seemed to him to make a difference even now, when the photograph itself, as well as the event it recorded, was only memory. Was the party's hold upon the past less strong, he wondered, because a piece of evidence which existed no longer had once existed? But today, supposing that it could be somehow resurrected from its ashes, the photograph might not even be evidence. Already at the time when he made his discovery, Oceania was no longer at war with Eurasia, and it must have been to the agents of East Asia that the three dead men had betrayed their country. Since then, there had been other changes. Two, three, he could not remember how many. Very likely the confessions had been rewritten and rewritten until the original facts and dates no longer had the smallest significance. The past not only changed, but changed continuously. What most afflicted him with the sense of nightmare was that he had never clearly understood why the huge imposture was undertaken. The immediate advantages of falsifying the past were obvious, but the ultimate motive was mysterious. He took up his pen again and wrote, I understand how. I do not understand why. He wondered as he had many times wondered before, whether he himself was a lunatic. Perhaps a lunatic was simply a minority of one. At one time it had been a sign of madness to believe that the earth goes around the sun. Today, to believe that the past is inalterable. He might be alone in holding that belief, and if alone, then a lunatic. But the thought of being a lunatic did not greatly trouble him. The horror was that he might also be wrong. He picked up the children's history book and looked at the portrait of Big Brother which formed its frontispiece. The hypnotic eyes gazed into his own. It was as though some huge force were pressing down upon you, something that penetrated inside your skull, battering against your brain, frightening you out of your beliefs, persuading you 
almost, to deny the evidence of your senses. In the end, the party would announce that two and two made five, and you would have to believe it. It was inevitable that they should make that claim sooner or later. The logic of their position demanded it. Not merely the validity of experience, but the very existence of external reality was tacitly denied by their philosophy. The heresy of heresies was common sense. And what was terrifying was not that they would kill you for thinking otherwise, but that they might be right. For after all, how do we know that two and two make four, or that the force of gravity works, or that the past is unchangeable? If both the past and the external world exist only in the mind, and if the mind itself is controllable, what then? But no, his courage seemed suddenly to stiffen of its own accord. The face of O'Brien, not called up by any obvious association, had floated into his mind. He knew, with more certainty than before, that O'Brien was on his side. He was writing the diary for O'Brien. To O'Brien. It was like an interminable letter which no one would ever read, but which was addressed to a particular person and took its colour from that fact. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final most essential command. His heart sank as he thought of the enormous power arrayed against him, the ease with which any party intellectual would overthrow him in debate, the subtle arguments which he would not be able to understand, much less answer. And yet, he was in the right. They were wrong, and he was right. The obvious, the silly, and the true had got to be defended. Truisms are true. Hold on to that. The solid world exists. Its laws do not change. Stones are hard. Water is wet. Objects unsupported fall towards the Earth's centre. With the feeling that he was speaking to O'Brien, and also that he was setting forth an important axiom, he wrote, Freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four. If that is granted, all else follows. From somewhere at the bottom of a passage, the smell of roasting coffee, real coffee, not victory coffee, came floating out into the street. Winston paused involuntarily. For perhaps two seconds, he was back in the half-forgotten world of his childhood. Then a door banged, seeming to cut off the smell as abruptly as though it had been a sound. He'd walked several kilometres over pavements, and his varicose also was throbbing. This was the second time in three weeks that he had missed an evening at the community centre. A rash act, since you could be certain that the number of your attendances at the centre was carefully checked. In principle, a party member had no spare time, and was never alone except in bed. It was assumed that when he was not working, eating, or sleeping, he would be taking part in some kind of communal recreation. To do anything that suggested a taste for solitude, even to go for a walk by yourself, was always slightly dangerous. There was a word for it in Newspeak. Own life, it was called. 
meaning individualism and eccentricity. But this evening, as he came out of the ministry, the balminess of the April air had tempted him. The sky was a warmer blue than he had seen it that year, and suddenly the long, noisy evening at the centre, the boring, exhausting games, the lectures, the creaking camaraderie oiled by gin, had seemed intolerable. On impulse, he had turned away from the bus stop and wandered off into the labyrinth of London, first south, then east, then north again, losing himself among unknown streets and hardly bothering in which direction he was going. If there is hope, he had written in the diary, it lies in the prose. The words kept coming back to him. Statement of a mystical truth and a palpable absurdity. He was somewhere in the vague brown-coloured slums to the north and east of what had once been St Pancras Station. He was walking up a cobbled street of little two-storey houses with battered doorways which gave straight on the pavement, and which were somehow curiously suggestive of rat holes. There were puddles of filthy water here and there among the cobbles. In and out of the dark doorways and down narrow alleyways that branched off on either side, people swarmed in astonishing numbers. Girls in full bloom with crudely lipsticked mouths, and youths who chased the girls, and swollen, waddling women who showed you what the girls would be like in ten years' time, and old, bent creatures shuffling along on splayed feet, and ragged, barefooted children who played in the puddles and then scattered at angry yells from their mothers. Perhaps a quarter of the windows in the street were broken and boarded up. Most of the people paid no attention to Winston. A few eyed him with a sort of guarded curiosity. Two monstrous women with brick-red forearms folded across their aprons were talking outside a doorway. Winston caught scraps of conversation as he approached. Yes, I says to her, that's all very well, I says, but if you'd have been in my place, you'd have done the same as what I'd done. It's easy to criticise, I says, but you ain't got the same problems as what I got. Ah, oh, said the other. That's just it, that's just where it is. The strident voices stopped abruptly. The women studied him in hostile silence as he went past. But it was not hostility, exactly. Merely a kind of wariness, a momentary stiffening, as at the passing of some unfamiliar animal. The blue overalls of the party could not be a common sight in a street like this. Indeed, it was unwise to be seen in such places unless you had definite business there. The patrols might stop you if you happened to run into them. May I see your papers, comrade? What are you doing here? What time did you leave work? Is this your usual way home? And so on, and so forth. Not that there was any rule against walking home by an unusual route, but it was enough to draw attention to you, if the thought police heard about it. Suddenly the whole street was in commotion. There were yells of warning from all sides. People were shooting into the doorways like rabbits. A young woman leapt out of a doorway a little ahead of Winston, grabbed up a tiny child playing in a puddle, whipped her apron around it and leapt back again all in one movement. At the same instant, a man in a concertina-like black suit who had emerged from a side alley ran towards Winston, pointing excitedly to the sky. Steamer! he yelled. Look out, Gavner! Bang overhead! Lay down! Quick! Steamer was a nickname which, for some reason, the proles applied to rocket bombs. Winston promptly flung himself on his face. The proles were nearly always right when they gave you a warning of this kind. They seemed to possess some kind of instinct which told them several seconds in advance when a rocket was coming, although the rocket supposedly travelled faster than sound. Winston clasped his forearms above his head. There was a roar that seemed to make the pavement heave, a shower of light objects pattered onto his back. When he stood up, he found that he was covered with fragments of glass from the nearest window. He walked on. The bomb had demolished a group of houses 200 metres up the street. A black plume of smoke hung in the sky, and below it a cloud of plaster dust in which a crowd was already forming round the ruins. There was a little pile of plaster lying on the pavement ahead of him, and in the middle of it he could see a bright red streak. When he got up to it, he saw that it was a human hand severed at the wrist. Apart from the bloody stump, 
The hand was so completely whitened as to resemble a plaster cast. He kicked the thing into the gutter, and then, to avoid the crowd, turned down a side street to the right. Within three or four minutes he was out of the area which the bomb had affected, and the sordid, swarming life of the streets was going on as though nothing had happened. It was nearly twenty hours, and the drinking shops which the proles frequented, pubs, they called them, were choked with customers. From their grimy swing doors, endlessly opening and shutting, there came forth a smell of urine, sawdust, and sour beer. In an angle formed by a projecting house front, three men were standing very close together, the middle one of them holding a folded up newspaper which the other two were studying over his shoulders. Even before he was near enough to make out the expression on their faces, Winston could see absorption in every line of their bodies. It was obviously some serious piece of news they were reading. He was a few paces away from them when suddenly the group broke up and two of the men were in violent altercation. For a moment, they seemed almost on the point of blows. Can't you bleeding well listen to what I say? I tell you, no number ended in 781 for over 14 months. Yes, it has then. No, it has not. Back home, I got the old lot of them for over two years wrote down on a piece of paper. I take them down regular as the clock. And I tell you, no number ended in seven. Yes, a seven has one. I could pretty near tell you the bleeding number. 407 it ended in. It was February. Second week in February. February, your grandmother. I got it all down in black and white, and I tell you, no number. Oh, pack it in, said the third man. They were talking about the lottery. Winston looked back when he had gone 30 metres. They were still arguing with vivid, passionate faces. The lottery, with its weekly payout of enormous prizes, was the one public event to which the proles paid serious attention. It was probable that there were some millions of proles for whom the lottery was the principal, if not the only reason for remaining alive. It was their delight, their folly, their anodyne, their intellectual stimulant. Where the lottery was concerned... Even people who could barely read and write seemed capable of intricate calculations and staggering feats of memory. There was a whole tribe of men who made a living simply by selling systems, forecasts, and lucky amulets. Winston had nothing to do with the running of the lottery which was managed by the Ministry of Plenty, but he was aware, indeed everyone in the party was aware, that the prizes were largely imaginary. Only small sums were actually paid out the winners of the big prizes being non-existent persons. In the absence of any real intercommunication between one part of Oceania and another, this was not difficult to arrange. But, if there was hope, it lay in the proles. You had to cling on to that. When you put it in words, it sounded reasonable. It was when you looked at the human beings passing you on the pavement that it became an act of faith. The street into which he had turned ran downhill. He had a feeling that he had been in this neighbourhood before, and that there was a main thoroughfare not far away. From somewhere ahead there came a din of shouting voices. The street took a sharp turn and then ended in a flight of steps which led down into a sunken alley where a few stallkeepers were selling tired-looking vegetables. At this moment Winston remembered where he was. The alley led out into the main street, and down the next turning, not five minutes away, was the junk shop where he had bought the blank book which was now his diary, and in a small stationer's shop not far away, he had bought his pen holder and his bottle of ink. He paused for a moment at the top of the steps. On the opposite side of the alley there was a dingy little pub whose windows appeared to be frosted over, but in reality were merely coated with dust. A very old man, bent but active, with white moustaches that bristled forward like those of a prawn, pushed open the swing door and went in. As Winston stood watching, it occurred to him that the old man, who must be eighty at the least, had already been middle-aged when the revolution happened. He and a few others like him were the last links that now existed with the vanished world of capitalism. In the party itself, there were not many people left whose ideas had been formed before the revolution, the older generation had mostly been wiped out in the great purges of the fifties and sixties, and the few who survived had long ago been terrified into complete intellectual surrender. 
if there was anyone still alive who could give you a truthful account of conditions in the early part of the century, it could only be a prawl. Suddenly the passage from the history book that he had copied into his diary came back into Winston's mind, and a lunatic impulse took hold of him. He would go into the pub. He would scrape acquaintance with that old man and question him. He would say to him, Tell me about your life when you were a boy. What was it like in those days? Were things better than they are now, or were they worse? Hurriedly, lest he should have time to become frightened, he descended the steps and crossed the narrow street. It was madness, of course. As usual, there was no definite rule against talking to proles and frequenting their pubs, but it was far too unusual an action to pass unnoticed. If the patrols appeared, he might plead an attack of faintness, but it was not likely that they would believe him. He pushed open the door, and a hideous, cheesy smell of sour beer hit him in the face. As he entered, the dinner voices dropped to about half its volume. Behind his back, he could feel everyone eyeing his blue overalls. The game of darts which was going on at the other end of the room interrupted itself for perhaps as much as thirty seconds. The old man whom he had followed was standing at the bar, having some kind of altercation with the barman. A large, stout, hook-nosed young man with enormous forearms. A knot of others, standing round with glasses in their hands, were watching the scene. "'I asked you civil enough, didn't I?' said the old man, straightening his shoulders pugnaciously. "'You telling me you ain't got a pint mug in the old bleeding boozer? "'And what in hell's name is a pint?' said the barman, leaning forward with the tips of his fingers on the counter. "'Hark at him! Calls himself a barman and don't know what a pint is?' Why, a pint's the half of a quart, and there's four quarts to the gallon. Have to teach you the ABC next. Never heard of him, said the barman shortly. Litre and half litre, that's all we serve. There's the glasses on the shelf in front of you. I likes a pint, persisted the old man. You could have drawed me off a pint easy enough. We didn't have these bleeding litres when I was a young man. When you were a young man, we were all living in the treetops, said the barman, with a glance at the other customers. There was a shout of laughter, and the uneasiness caused by Winston's entry seemed to disappear. The old man's white stubbled face had flushed pink. He turned away, muttering to himself, and bumped into Winston. Winston caught him gently by the arm. May I offer you a drink? he said. You're a gent, said the other, straightening his shoulders again. He appeared not to have noticed Winston's blue overalls. Point, he added aggressively to the barman. Point a wallop. The barman swished two half litres of dark brown beer into thick glasses, which he had rinsed in a bucket under the counter. Beer was the only drink you could get in prole pubs. The proles were not supposed to drink gin, though in practice they could get hold of it easily enough. The game of darts was in full swing again, and the knot of men at the bar had begun talking about lottery tickets. Winston's presence was forgotten for a moment. There was a deal table under the window where he and the old man could talk without fear of being overheard. It was horribly dangerous. But at any rate, there was no telescreen in the room, a point he had made sure of as soon as he came in. He could have drawed me off a pint grumbled the old man as he settled down behind his glass. A half litre ain't enough. It, it don't satisfy. And an old litre's too much. Starts me bladder running. Let alone the price. You must have seen great changes since you were a young man, said Winston tentatively. The old man's pale blue eyes moved from the darts board to the bar, and from the bar to the door of the gents, as though it were in the bar room that he expected the changes to have occurred. The beer was better, he said finally. And cheaper. When I was a young man, mild beer, wallop we used to call it, was four pence a pint. That was before the war, of course. Which war was that? said Winston. It's all wars, said the old man vaguely. He took up his glass 
and his shoulders straightened again. He is wishing you the very best of health. In his lean throat, the sharp-pointed Adam's apple made a surprising, rapid up-and-down movement, and the beer vanished. Winston went to the bar and came back with two more half-litres. The old man appeared to have forgotten his prejudice against drinking a full litre. "'You are very much older than I am,' said Winston. "'You must have been a grown man before I was born. "'You can remember what it was like in the old days, before the Revolution. "'People of my age don't really know anything about those times. "'We can only read about them in books, and what it says in the books may not be true. "'I should like your opinion on that. "'The history books say that life before the Revolution was completely different from what it is now. "'There was the most terrible oppression.' Injustice, poverty, worse than anything we can imagine. Here in London, the great mass of the people never had enough to eat from birth to death. Half of them hadn't even boots on their feet. They worked twelve hours a day, they left school at nine, they slept ten in a room. And at the same time, there were very few people, only a few thousands, the capitalists, they were called, who were rich and powerful. They owned everything that there was to own, they lived in great, gorgeous houses with thirty servants. They rode about in motor cars and four horse carriages. They drank champagne. They wore top hats. The old man brightened suddenly. Top hats, he said. Funny you should mention them. The same thing coming to my head only yesterday. I don't know why. I was just thinking I ain't seen a top hat in years. Gone right out they have. The last time I wore one was at my sister-in-law's funeral, and that was... Well, I couldn't give you the date, but it must have been fifty years ago. Of course, it were only hired for the occasion, you understand? It isn't very important about the top hats, said Winston patiently. The point is, these capitalists... They and a few lawyers and priests and so forth who lived on them were the lords of the earth. Everything existed for their benefit. You, the ordinary people, the workers, were their slaves. They could do what they liked with you. They could ship you off to Canada like cattle. They could sleep with your daughters if they chose. They could order you to be flogged with something called a cat o' nine tails. You had to take your cap off when you passed them. Every capitalist went about with a gang of lackeys who... The old man brightened again. Lackeys, he said. Now there's a word I ain't heard since ever so long. <laughs> Lackeys. That regular takes me back, that does. I recollect, oh, donkeys years ago, I... I used to sometimes go to Hyde Park of a Sunday afternoon to hear the blokes making speeches. Salvation Army, Roman Catholics, Jews, Indians, all sorts there was. And there was one bloke, well, I, I couldn't give you his name, but a real powerful speaker he was. He didn't half give it him. <laughs> lackeys, he says, lackeys of the bourgeoisie, flankies of the ruling class. Parasites, that was another of them. And yeeners. He definitely called him Yenus. Of course, he was referring to the Labour Party, you understand? Winston had the feeling that they were talking at cross-purposes. What I really wanted to know was this, he said. Do you feel that you have more freedom now than you had in those days? Are you treated more like a human being? In the old days, the rich people, the people at the top... The House of Lords, put in the old man reminiscently. The House of Lords, if you like. What I'm asking is, were these people able to treat you as an inferior simply because they were rich and you were poor? Is it a fact, for instance, that you had to call them sir and take off your cap when you passed them? The old man appeared to think deeply. He drank off about a quarter of his beer before answering. Yes, he said. They like you to touch your cap to him. It showed respect, like. I didn't agree with it myself, but I'd done it often enough. Had to, as you might say. And was it usual? I'm only quoting what I've read in history books. Was it usual for these people and their servants to push you off the pavement into the gutter? One of them pushed me once, 
said the old man. I recollect it as if it were yesterday. It was boat race night. Terrible rowdy they used to get on boat race night. When I bumps into a young bloke on Shaftesbury Avenue, quite the gent he was. Dress shirt, top hat, black overcoat. He was kind of zigzagging across the pavement and I bumps into him, accidental like. He says, why can't you look where you're going, he says. I says, do you think you've bought the bleeding pavement? He says, I'll twist your bloody head off if you get fresh with me. I says, you're drunk. <laughs> I'll give you in charge in half a minute, I says, and if you'll believe me, he puts his hand on my chest and gives me a shove as he's pretty near sent me under the wheels of a bus. Well, I was young in them days, and I was going to have fetched him one, only... A sense of helplessness took hold of Winston. The old man's memory was nothing but a rubbish heap of details. One could question him all day without getting any real information. The party histories might still be true, after a fashion. They might even be completely true. He made a last attempt. Perhaps I've not made myself clear, he said. What I'm trying to say is this. You have been alive a very long time. You lived half your life before the revolution. In 1925, for instance, you were already grown up. Would you say, from what you can remember, that life in 1925 was better than it is now, or worse? If you could choose, would you prefer to live then, or now? The old man looked meditatively at the darts board. He finished up his beer more slowly than before. When he spoke, it was with a tolerant, philosophic air, as though the beer had mellowed him. I know what you expect me to say, he said. You expect me to say as I'd sooner be young again. Most people'd say they'd sooner be young if you asked them. You got your health and strength when you're young. When you get to my time of life, you ain't never well. I suffer something wicked from my feet, and my blood is just terrible. Six and seven times a night it has me out of bed. On the other hand, there's great advantages in being old man. You ain't got the same worries. No track with women, and that's a great thing. I ain't had a woman for near on thirty year, if you credit it. Not wanted to, what's more. Winston sat back against the windowsill. It was no use going on. He was about to buy some more beer when the old man suddenly got up and shuffled rapidly into the stinking urinal at the side of the room. The extra half-litre was already working on him. Winston sat for a minute or two gazing at his empty glass and hardly noticed when his feet carried him out into the street again. Within thirty years at the most, he reflected, the huge and simple question, was life better before the revolution than it is now, would have ceased once and for all to be answerable. But in effect, it was unanswerable even now since the few scattered survivors from the ancient world were incapable of comparing one age with another. They remembered a million useless things. A quarrel with a workmate, a hunt for a lost bicycle pump, the expression on a long-dead sister's face, the swirls of dust on a windy morning seventy years ago. But all the relevant facts were outside the range of their vision. They were like the ant, which can see small objects, but not large ones. And when memory failed and written records were falsified, when that happened, the claim of the party to have improved the conditions of human life had got to be accepted because they did not exist and never again could exist any standard against which it could be tested. At this moment, his train of thought stopped abruptly. He halted and looked up. He was in a narrow street, with a few dark little shops interspersed among dwelling houses. Immediately above his head there hung three discoloured metal balls, which looked as if they'd once been gilded. He seemed to know the place. Of course, 
he was standing outside the junk shop where he had bought the diary. A twinge of fear went through him. It had been a sufficiently rash act to buy the book in the beginning, and he had sworn never to come near the place again. And yet the instant that he allowed his thoughts to wander, his feet had brought him back here of their own accord. It was precisely against suicidal impulses of this kind that he had hoped to guard himself by opening the diary. At the same time, he noticed that although it was nearly twenty-one hours, the shop was still open. With the feeling that he would be less conspicuous inside than hanging about on the pavement, he stepped through the doorway. If questioned, he could plausibly say that he was trying to buy razor blades. The proprietor had just lighted a hanging oil lamp which gave off an unclean but friendly smell. He was a man of perhaps sixty, frail and bowed, with a long benevolent nose and mild eyes, distorted by thick spectacles. His hair was almost white, but his eyebrows were bushy and still black. His spectacles, his gentle, fussy movements, and the fact that he was wearing an aged jacket of black velvet, gave him a vague air of intellectuality, as though he had been some kind of literary man or perhaps a musician. His voice was soft, as though faded, and his accent less debased than that of the majority of proles. "'I recognised you on the pavement,' he said immediately. "'You're the gentleman that bought the young lady's keepsake album. That was a beautiful bit of paper, that was.' Cream laid, it used to be called. There's been no paper like that made for, oh, I dare say fifty years. He peered at Winston over the top of his spectacles. Is there anything special I can do for you, or did you just want to look round? I was passing, said Winston vaguely. I just looked in. I don't want anything in particular. It's just as well, said the other, because I don't suppose I could have satisfied you. He made an apologetic gesture with his soft-palmed hand. You see how it is. An empty shop, you might say. Between you and me, the antique trade's just about finished. No demand any longer, and no stock either. Furniture... China, glass, it's all been broken up by degrees, and, of course, the metal stuff's mostly been melted down. I haven't seen a brass candlestick in years. The tiny interior of the shop was in fact uncomfortably full, but there was almost nothing in it of the slightest value. The floor space was very restricted, because all round the walls were stacked innumerable dusty picture frames. In the window there were trays of nuts and bolts, worn-out chisels, penknives with broken blades, tarnished watches that did not even pretend to be in going order, and other miscellaneous rubbish. Only on a small table in the corner was there a litter of odds and ends, lacquered snuff-boxes, agate brooches and the like, which looked as though they might include something interesting. As Winston wandered towards the table, his eye was caught by a round, smooth thing that gleamed softly in the lamplight, and he picked it up. It was a heavy lump of glass, curved on one side, flat on the other, making almost a hemisphere. There was a peculiar softness, as of rainwater, in both the colour and the texture of the glass. At the heart of it, magnified by the curved surface, there was a strange pink, convoluted object that recalled a rose, or a sea anemone. "'What is it?' said Winston, fascinated. "'That's coral, that is,' said the old man. "'It must have come from the Indian Ocean. "'They used to kind of embed it in the glass. "'That wasn't made less than a hundred years ago. "'More, by the look of it.' "'It's a beautiful thing,' said Winston. "'It is a beautiful thing.' said the other appreciatively. But there's not many that would say so nowadays. <coughs> he coughed. Now, if it so happened that you wanted to buy it, that would cost you four dollars. I can remember when a thing like that would have fetched eight pounds, and 
eight pounds was, um, well, I, I can't work it out, but it was a lot of money. But who cares about genuine antiques nowadays? Even the few that's left. Winston immediately paid over the four dollars and slid the coveted thing into his pocket. What appealed to him about it was not so much its beauty as the air it seemed to possess of belonging to an age quite different from the present one. The soft, rain-watery glass was not like any glass that he had ever seen. The thing was doubly attractive because of its apparent uselessness, though he could guess that it must once have been intended as a paperweight. It was very heavy in his pocket, but fortunately it did not make much of a bulge. It was a queer thing, even a compromising thing, for a party member to have in his possession. Anything old, and for that matter anything beautiful, was always vaguely suspect. The old man had grown noticeably more cheerful after receiving the four dollars. Winston realised that he would have accepted three, or even two. There's another room upstairs that you might care to take a look at, he said. There's not much in it, just a few pieces. We'll do with a light if we're going upstairs. He lit another lamp and, with bowed back, led the way slowly up the steep and worn stairs and along a tiny passage into a room which did not give on the street but looked out on a cobbled yard and a forest of chimney pots. Winston noticed that the furniture was still arranged as though the room were meant to be lived in. There was a strip of carpet on the floor, a picture or two on the walls, and a deep slatternly armchair drawn up to the fireplace. An old-fashioned glass clock with a twelve-hour face was ticking away on the mantelpiece. Under the window, and occupying nearly a quarter of the room, was an enormous bed with the mattress still on it. "'We lived here till my wife died,' said the old man, half apologetically. I'm selling the furniture off by little and little. Now, that's a beautiful mahogany bed. Or at least it would be if you could get the bugs out of it. But I dare say you'd find it a little bit cumbersome. He was holding the lamp high up, so as to illuminate the whole room. And in the warm, dim light, the place looked curiously inviting. The thought flitted through Winston's mind that it would probably be quite easy to rent the room for a few dollars a week, if he dared to take the risk. It was a wild, impossible notion, to be abandoned as soon as thought of. But the room had awakened in him a sort of nostalgia, a sort of ancestral memory. It seemed to him that he knew exactly what it felt like to sit in a room like this, in an armchair beside an open fire with your feet in the fender and a kettle on the hob. Utterly alone, utterly secure, with nobody watching you, no voice pursuing you, no sound except the singing of the kettle and the friendly ticking of the clock. There's no telescreen, he could not help murmuring. Ah, said the old man. I never had one of those things. Too expensive. And I never seemed to feel the need of it, somehow. Now that's a nice gate-leg table in the corner there. Though, of course, you'd have to put new hinges on it if you wanted to use the flaps. There was a small bookcase in the other corner, and Winston had already gravitated towards it. It contained nothing but rubbish. The hunting down and destruction of books had been done with the same thoroughness in the prole quarters as everywhere else. It was very unlikely that there existed anywhere in Oceania a copy of a book printed earlier than 1960. The old man, still carrying the lamp, was standing in front of a picture in a rosewood frame which hung on the other side of the fireplace, opposite the bed. Now, uh, if you happen to be interested in old prints at all, he began delicately. Winston came across to examine the picture. It was a steel engraving of an oval building, with rectangular windows and a small tower in front. There was a railing running around the building, and at the rear end there was what appeared to be a statue. Winston gazed at it for some moments. It seemed vaguely familiar, though he did not remember the statue. The frame's fixed to the wall, said the old man. But I could unscrew it for you, I dare say. I know that building, 
said Winston, finally. It's a ruin now. It's in the middle of the street outside the Palace of Justice. That's right. Outside the law courts. It was bombed in... Uh, oh, so many years ago. It was a church at one time. St. Clement's Dane, its name was. He smiled apologetically, as though conscious of saying something slightly ridiculous, and added... Oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clement's. What's that? said Winston. Oh, oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clement's. That was a rhyme we had when I was a little boy. How it goes on, I don't remember, but I do know it ended up. Here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. It was a kind of a dance. They held out their arms for you to pass under, and when they came to Here comes a chopper to chop off your head, they brought their arms down and caught you. It was just names of churches. All the London churches were in it. All the principal ones, that is. Winston wondered vaguely to what century the church belonged. It was always difficult to determine the age of a London building. Anything large and impressive, if it was reasonably new in appearance, was automatically claimed as having been built since the Revolution, while anything that was obviously of earlier date was ascribed to some dim period called the Middle Ages. The centuries of capitalism were held to have produced nothing of any value. One could not learn history from architecture any more than one could learn it from books. Statues, inscriptions, memorial stones, the names of streets... Anything that might throw light upon the past had been systematically altered. I never knew it had been a church, he said. There's a lot of them left, really, said the old man. Though they've been put to other uses. Now, how did that rhyme go? Ah, I've got it. Oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clement's you owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. There, now that's as far as I can get. A farthing that was a small copper coin, looked something like a cent. Where was St. Martin's? said Winston. St. Martin's? That's still standing. It's in Victory Square alongside the picture gallery. A building with a kind of a triangular porch and pillars in front, and a big flight of steps. Winston knew the place well. It was a museum used for propaganda displays of various kinds. Scale models of rocket bombs and floating fortresses, waxwork tableau illustrating enemy atrocities and the like. St. Martin's in the Fields, it used to be called, supplemented the old man, though I don't recollect any fields anywhere in those parts. Winston did not buy the picture. It would have been an even more incongruous possession than the glass paperweight and impossible to carry home, unless it were taken out of its frame. But he lingered for some minutes more talking to the old man, whose name he discovered was not Weeks, as one might have gathered from the inscription over the shop front, but Charrington. Mr. Charrington, it seemed, was a widower aged 63, and had inhabited this shop for 30 years. Throughout that time he had been intending to alter the name over the window, but had never quite got to the point of doing it. All the while that they were talking, the half-remembered rhyme kept running through Winston's head. Oranges and lemons say the bells of St. Clement's. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. It was curious, but when you said it to yourself, you had the illusion of actually hearing bells. The bells of a lost London that still existed somewhere or other, disguised and forgotten. From one ghostly steeple after another, he seemed to hear them peeling forth. Yet so far as he could remember, he had never in real life heard church bells ringing. He got away from Mr. Charrington and went down the stairs alone, so as not to let the old man see him reconnoitering the street before stepping out of the door. He had already made up his mind that after a suitable interval, a month, say, he would take the risk of visiting the shop again. It was perhaps not more dangerous than shirking an evening at the centre. 
The serious piece of folly had been to come back here in the first place, after buying the diary, and without knowing whether the proprietor of the shop could be trusted. However, yes, he thought again. He would come back. He would buy further scraps of beautiful rubbish. He would buy the engraving of St. Clement's Dane, take it out of its frame, and carry it home concealed under the jacket of his overalls. He would drag the rest of that poem out of Mr. Charrington's memory. Even the lunatic project of renting the room upstairs flashed momentarily through his mind again. For perhaps five seconds, exultation made him careless, and he stepped out onto the pavement without so much as a preliminary glance through the window. He'd even started humming to an improvised tune. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clemens. You owe me three farthings, say the... Suddenly his heart seemed to turn to ice and his bowels to water. A figure in blue overalls was coming down the pavement not ten metres away. It was the girl from the fiction department. The girl with dark hair. The light was failing, but there was no difficulty in recognising her. She looked him straight in the face, then walked quickly on as though she had not seen him. For a few seconds, Winston was too paralysed to move. Then he turned to the right and walked heavily away, not noticing for the moment that he was going in the wrong direction. At any rate, one question was settled. There was no doubting any longer that the girl was spying on him. She must have followed him here, because it was not credible that by pure chance she should have happened to be walking on the same evening, up the same obscure back street, kilometres distant from any quarter where party members lived. It was too great a coincidence. Whether she was really an agent of the Thought Police, or simply an amateur spy actuated by officiousness, hardly mattered. It was enough that she was watching him. Probably she had seen him go into the pub as well. It was an effort to walk. The lump of glass in his pocket banged against his thigh at each step, and he was half-minded to take it out and throw it away. The worst thing was the pain in his belly. For a couple of minutes he had the feeling that he would die if he did not reach a lavatory soon, but there would be no public lavatories in a quarter like this. Then the spasm passed, leaving a dull ache behind. The street was a blind alley. Winston halted, stood for several seconds wondering vaguely what to do, then turned round and began to retrace his steps. As he turned, it occurred to him that the girl had only passed him three minutes ago, and that by running he could probably catch up with her. He could keep on her track till they were in some quiet place and then smash her skull in with a cobblestone. The piece of glass in his pocket would be heavy enough for the job, but he abandoned the idea immediately because even the thought of making any physical effort was unbearable. He could not run. He could not strike a blow. Besides, she was young and lusty and would defend herself. He thought also of hurrying to the community centre and staying there till the place closed so as to establish a partial alibi for the evening, but that too was impossible. A deadly lassitude had taken hold of him. All he wanted was to get home quickly, and then sit down and be quiet. It was after twenty-two hours when he got back to the flat. The lights would be switched off at the main at twenty-three thirty. He went into the kitchen and swallowed nearly a teacup full of victory gin. Then he went to the table in the alcove, sat down, and took the diary out of the drawer. But he did not open it at once. From the telescreen, a brassy female voice was squalling a patriotic song. He sat staring at the marbled cover of the book, trying without success to shut the voice out of his consciousness. It was at night that they came for you. Always at night. The proper thing was to kill yourself before they got you. Undoubtedly, some people did so. Many of the disappearances were actually suicides. But it needed desperate courage to kill yourself in a world where firearms or any quick and certain poison were completely unprocurable. 
He thought with a kind of astonishment of the biological uselessness of pain and fear. The treachery of the human body which always freezes into inertia at exactly the moment when a special effort is needed. He might have silenced the dark-haired girl if only he had acted quickly enough, but precisely because of the extremity of his danger, he had lost the power to act. It struck him that in moments of crisis, one is never fighting against an external enemy, but always against one's own body. Even now, in spite of the gin, the dull ache in his belly made consecutive thought impossible. And it is the same, he perceived, in all seemingly heroic or tragic situations, on the battlefield, in the torture chamber, on a sinking ship. The issues that you are fighting for are always forgotten because the body swells up until it fills the universe and even when you are not paralysed by fright or screaming with pain, life is a moment-to-moment -moment struggle against hunger or cold or sleeplessness, against a sour stomach or an aching tooth. He opened the diary. It was important to write something down. The woman on the telescreen had started a new song. Her voice seemed to stick into his brain like jagged splinters of glass. He tried to think of O'Brien, for whom, or to whom, the diary was written. But instead he began thinking of the things that would happen to him after the thought police took him away. It would not matter if they killed you at once. To be killed was what you expected. But before death, nobody spoke of such things, yet everybody knew of them, there was the routine of confession that had to be gone through. The grovelling on the floor and screaming for mercy. The crack of broken bones, the smashed teeth and bloody clots of hair. Why did you have to endure it? Since the end was always the same. Why was it not possible to cut a few days or weeks out of your life? Nobody ever escaped detection, and nobody ever failed to confess. When once you had succumbed to thought crime, it was certain that by a given date you would be dead. Why then did that horror, which altered nothing, have to lie embedded in future time? He tried with a little more success than before to summon up the image of O'Brien. We shall meet in the place where there is no darkness, O'Brien had said to him. He knew what it meant, or thought he knew. The place where there is no darkness was the imagined future, which one would never see, but which, by foreknowledge, one could mystically share in. But with the voice from the telescreen nagging at his ears, he could not follow the train of thought further. He put a cigarette in his mouth. Half the tobacco promptly fell out onto his tongue, a bitter dust which was difficult to spit out again. The face of Big Brother swam into his mind, displacing that of O'Brien. Just as he had done a few days earlier, he slid a coin out of his pocket and looked at it. The face gazed up at him, heavy, calm, protecting. But what kind of smile was hidden beneath the dark moustache? Like a leaden knell, the words came back at him. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. And with that, we reach the end of part one. Stephen here. Thank you so very much for listening this far into the story. It really is an incredible book, beautiful writing. Some of the absolute best that I can personally think of. It seems to be one of those books that just really sticks with you once you've read it. Impossible to shift from the mind. I've heard that's the case certainly for many people, and it was the case for myself. 
I first read 1984 when I was about 16, doing my A-levels, I was studying English literature, and I must say, the first time I read it, I didn't fall in love with it. It was heavy, dour, difficult, and we were studying it very intensely, going over certain sections time and time again, and uh, it was a bit of a slog. But even so, I could tell why it was something special and it had such an impact. It was certainly not like anything I'd read up until that point. But about a year later, I'd read Animal Farm in the meantime. I decided to just sit down and just read it for my own pleasure, at my own speed. And I was absolutely captivated. And it's always sort of had a special place in my mind ever since. Do share your thoughts and feelings down in the comments. It's always lovely to get a glimpse into your mind, see what you're thinking about everything. And I will see you in chapter one of part two as soon as I can get that together for you. If you would like to offer some support for this project and the production of other audio projects such as this, please do consider joining me over on my Patreon or by simply becoming a channel member here on YouTube. With that membership, you are able to get access to downloadable audio libraries, as well as some other little extras. If you've any questions about it, do just drop a comment. You can send me an email. There are more details in the video description. You take care now, wherever you are and whatever you're up to. Thanks for all the ongoing support you really are a wonderful bunch. Read to you soon.